In the entirety of American history, few rivalries have been as fierce and fearsome as that between the venerable Comanche Empire and the Texas Rangers. The Comanche, with their combination of strategic brilliance, tactical prowess, and ruthless reputation, forestalled American expansion in Texas for the better part of a century. The Texas Rangers provided basically the only consequential resistance against the Comanche, and even then, the battles between these two factions often resulted in stories too brutal to be told in their totality on the silver screen. Here now, History the OK Corral brings you 10 of the most brutal battles ever fought between the Texas Rangers and the Comanche. San Antonio, June 1st, 1844. In what may have been the most dangerous territory in the world, a small group of 15 Texas Rangers rode northwest, leaving the relative safety of the city, on a mission to kill or capture the Comanche chief, Yellow Wolf, and his band of warriors. The entire area had been awash in fire and blood for weeks as the Comanche, the vaunted and venerable lords of the southern plains, had been wreaking death and destruction on anyone they saw as encroaching on their territory or who presented an easy and valuable target to both plunder and leave as a mangled reminder that Texas belonged to the Comanche. This group of veteran rangers was out to put a stop to that raiding. But to many an outside observer from the east, it might be difficult, at least from a distance, to distinguish this band of men headed through the rolling timber and sprawling meadows of the Texas hill country on that stiflingly hot day from the Comanche warriors or Mexican banditos they were so often on the trail of. They rode American quarter horses, a new world breed renowned for their speed over short distances with Spanish style bridles and saddles. They were not adorned in anything resembling a military uniform nor were many of their beards or haircuts up to military regulations. They wore no insignia, flew no flag, and carried only small rations of cornmeal and coffee, dried meat, and tobacco. Some wore wide-brimmed hats and serapes, others buckskin leggings, others moccasins and fringed buckskin shirts, while still others wore cotton pants and coonskin hats. They were mostly between the ages of 18 and 35, from all manner of backgrounds. But they had one thing in common. They had all come to Texas, and they had all become rangers, for the same reason. Because they did not want to farm. They did not want to open saloons or mercantile stores. Nor did they want anything to do with the big cities or civilized life. They had become rangers because they wanted to fight. They were to say the least, a dangerous bunch of men. They were armed with single-shot rifles, tomahawks, bowie knives, and, new to this battlefield, multiple-shot Walker Colt revolvers, which enabled them to fire off five rounds in succession before having to reload. This could spell life or death on the Texas frontier, especially against the Comanche. The stakes were high, danger was everywhere, and violence was both dreadful and plentiful. The difference between victory and being tortured to death was often decided in moments, and only men with ice in their veins and a capacity to wreak violence on another had any place out here, in the lands beyond San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas, in the lands where the Comanche reigned. The Rangers were some of the few who could stay alive and even win in this unforgiving but bountiful land whose timbered hills gave way to endless prairies, whose peaceful streams and ubiquitous wildflowers lay in stark contrast to the vast quantities of blood that soaked into its chalky, parched caliche dust. Here there was nowhere to run, here there was nowhere to hide. The small group of rangers that day rode under the command of a diminutive, high-voiced 27-year-old. He had boyish features and an unassuming demeanor, but was feared and respected by friends and foe alike. He had dark hair, and what stood out most were his dark, cool, killer eyes. 
you can look at his picture today, you see it on the video here, and you will see a man whose eyes convey all these years later that he is not afraid. Even the Comanche, who disdained their enemies, yes, but disdained cowardice more, admired him. They said he was heap brave and had no fear. They called him Bravo Too Much, Capitanyak, or Captain Jack. When asked to describe Hayes, a close friend and Indian guide would say that we would follow him into hell, but he would ride into hell all by himself. His name was Captain John Coffey Hayes. He had been born into a vaunted military family in 1817 in Little Cedar Lake, Tennessee. His father had served under Andrew Jackson, and he was named after Jackson's famous aide, John Coffey. He had made his way to Texas as a young man in search of fortune and adventure. He began as a land surveyor, and soon joined up with the fledgling rangers, who had just been stood up by the newly independent Texas as a means of policing and protecting the area. But, as fearsome as their reputation would become, at this point, the rangers had only been marginally effective in curtailing the bloodshed and had taken horrendous losses. One old-time ranger from the era estimated that about 50% were killed every year at the very beginning. They were underfunded, under-equipped, but made up for all of this with plenty of pure, distilled aggression. They had the heart to fight, but Jack Hayes, who had risen quickly in this violent and unforgiving world, gave them direction. And armed with their new revolvers, he believed that he could finally take the fight to the feared and fearsome Comanche. On June 8th, after following the Pinta Trail about 60 miles northwest of San Antonio, just north of where today's Farm to Market Road 1326 crosses the Guadalupe River in Kendall County, in an area known as Walker's Creek, the group stopped to gather some honey from a tree. Hayes had left a few men riding well behind them in order to see if they were being followed. Soon, those men rode into the small camp, saying that they had found Comanche horse tracks just behind the main party, and the rangers were indeed being followed. At this point, Noah Cheery, the youngest of the bunch, was up in a tree when he spotted a group of Comanches in the distance and alerted Hayes that, quote, Jerusalem, Captain, yonder comes a thousand Indians. That's the best impression I got. Hayes told his men to saddle up. It was go time. They rode out in pursuit of the Comanche, whose true numbers are estimated to have been anywhere from 40 to 200 warriors. First, they encountered a few young warriors who made a huge show of fleeing away from the advancing Texans, an old trick used to lure an attacking force deep into an ambush. The rangers had seen this before and did not go for the bait. They came upon a group of warriors ranging from 20 to 40 Comanche atop a small hill behind which ran a ravine and then a larger hill behind that. From their positions, the Comanche taunted the rangers in both English and Spanish to come fight and to charge. Doing so in any fight before this would have spelt almost certain death as single shot rifles and pistols would render the attackers completely defenseless after one or two shots. But now, with their new five shot Walker revolvers, Jack Hayes was going to change the way things were done. Before this, Rangers would ride into battle, dismount, and fight from cover, the way things had been done in the hills in the southeast. But that was no way to win against the highly mobile, highly aggressive, mounted Comanche. Now, Hayes and his men would take the fight directly to the Comanche, and seek to beat them at their own game. So Hayes and his men, instead of charging directly at the Comanche as they were being dared to, charged around the bottom of the hill flanking the Comanche and attacking them from behind. The fighting was up close and intense. Think like we were soldiers, but Old West. With Hayes yelling at his men to powder burn them, meaning to get so close before they fired on their targets that the gunpowder would scorch the Comanche's skin. Soon, the Comanche split their forces and wheeled around the Rangers in two groups. Here, breaking ranks for the Rangers would mean death. So, Hayes ordered his men to circle their horses, rump to rump, facing outward in order to absorb a series of Comanche attacks via arrows that flew down like hundreds or thousands of deadly stinging wasps, 
and 14-foot lances that were meant to kill buffalo, which could wreak havoc on the human torso. But after 15 minutes of this, the rangers had killed dozens of the Comanche with their revolvers, which were able to lay down fire in a manner the Comanche had never seen before. After grievously wounding four rangers and killing one, Yellowknife called for his warriors to disperse, and now a running fight ensued over two miles of hilly country that lasted more than an hour. The rangers would pursue, the Comanches would regroup and attack, the attack would be absorbed and repelled, and the Comanches would draw back further through the ravines and over the limestone hills. But after an hour of this, the rangers were out of ammunition. Now 30 to 45 warriors attacked them viciously. Hayes calmly asked for anyone with any ammunition left, and one man stepped forward, Robert Gillespie. On the next attack, Hayes ordered Gillespie to shoot the chief, Yellowknife. They waited until the Comanche chief charged within 30 yards of them, then Gillespie managed to shoot Yellowknife in the head and killed him with a single shot. For all their vaunted courage and cunning, the Comanche were very superstitious, and the fall of their chief meant that their puha, or medicine, which had served them so well in this fight, had somehow gone awry, and it was time to retreat. And so they did, howling in long, wolf-like cries as they dashed northwards on the open prairie. When it was all said and done, 20 Comanche, Yellowknife included, had been killed and around 30 had been wounded. One ranger, Samuel Walker, who would actually end up leading, lending his name to the Walker Colt revolver as they, as they refined this weapon, had been pinned to the ground with a lance. The rangers made camp to care for their wounded, and three days later, four Comanche came riding over the horizon in search of their dead. The rangers killed three of them. The West, specifically Texas, was a hard place. It was a world mired in gray and awash in violence, and it was shaped by hard people. Whether that be Yellowknife and his band of Comanche, or Hayes and his rangers, all existed in a brutal world where mercy was weakness and might made right. But history in Texas could be marked by a time before and a time after Jack Hayes. He was the man who had shaped the rangers, who had changed the way they fought, and helped shape the West. In 1847, he married Susan Calvert, and the couple would have three children together. But in 1849, Jack Hayes and the Hayes family would pack up and leave Texas for good. While he had certainly left his mark on the state, where there's a county named after him, it's just south of Travis County, or just like west, southwest of Travis County, Hayes had been struck by gold fever just like the rest of the country. Gold had been found at Sutter's Mill near Sacramento, and so the Hayes family and thousands of others went westward in search of gold in the hills and streams of California. But Texas, for all intents and purposes, still belonged to the Comanche, and the lords of the Southern Plains had not yet begun to fight. But that's another story for another time. Central Texas, 1845, nestled amongst the centuries-old oak trees and spring-fed creeks, sits an idyllic farmstead. Its owners, likely immigrants from Germany, have meticulously built a small but sturdy cabin and maintained their crops and livestock herds through daily, arduous labor. Their efforts, however, have proven to be tragically in vain, as the entire family now lies prostrate and cold in various positions about the farmstead the most recent victims of the Comanche raids that have been terrorizing the entirety of the Texas Hill Country for weeks now. This family has been targeted not because they have developed any personal animus between themselves and the Comanche, but because their mere presence here in what was known to the Spanish as Comancheria is tantamount to a declaration of war against the feared and fearsome lords of the Southern Plains. Their once bustling farmstead now lies still. The scene that unfolded only hours before must have been horrific, but it was not at all unique. The Comanche raiding party, quite large in this particular case numbering between two to three hundred, had swept down from the surrounding hills, killed all who posed even the most tacit threat of resistance, and made off with all of the prisoners and horses 
that they were able to. Now, as the sun makes its ascent, burning off the morning mist and making the day stiflingly hot by noontime, the Comanche are on their way west. They have been traveling hard since their early morning raid on the farmstead. Their raiding has indeed proven successful as they have gathered a large herd of horses stolen from several of the ranches surrounding the city of San Antonio. But the spoils of their effort are now proving to be a notable hindrance in their race to put distance between themselves and the Texans who would invariably pursue them. However, with the number of warriors present in this raiding party, the Comanche are not too concerned about the retaliation of a people who had proven all but inept in pursuing and engaging them. The Spanish had made their efforts in combating Comanche raiding, as had the Mexican government, as had virtually every sizable tribe in Texas. But at this point in 1845, with very few exceptions, the Comanche have operated with virtual impunity throughout the whole of Texas. They refer to the Texians and Mexicans as their livestock keepers, a people fit only to hold on to the vast horse herds until the Comanches see fit to take them. Their disdain for the settlers is certainly primarily due to their chosen location, as encroaching anywhere on the vast expanses of their rightful empire is an offense punishable by death. However, the Comanche also hold in contempt any culture, be it native or European-based, that practices sedentary agriculture. This is a decidedly distasteful livelihood by Comanche standards. They view their highly mobile hunting and raiding culture as a more masculine, honorable way of life and therefore assumed it to be universally preferable. However limited their cultural viewpoint may be, their tactics and practices have proven highly effective. The Comanche's ascension from perpetually beleaguered hunter-gatherers to the wealthiest tribe on the whole of the American plains has been perhaps as rapid a transition as any society has undergone in human history. By the early 19th century, they have taken over virtually the entirety of the Southern Plains, from present-day Kansas all the way to South Texas. However, their wealth is not only in land, but in horses. Because of their geographic location at the southernmost point of the Plains, the area that held the greatest concentration of settlements and of horses in the early 1800s, the Comanche were privy to the greatest selection of animals and the most opportunities to carry out raids. This led to the Comanche possessing far more horses than any other tribe. A typical young Comanche warrior might possess a herd of several dozen or even several hundred horses, a number comparable to even the wealthiest chiefs of more northerly tribes like the Sioux and Cheyenne. The economic importance of this advantage borders on incalculable, and the desire to maintain this advantage has left the Comanche with an unslakable thirst to continue adding to their collective and respective equine portfolios. Efforts to stop them, especially in the last few weeks, have proven maddeningly ineffective to both Texan farmers and government officials. As would happen several times throughout Texas history as Comanche attacks intensified, whole farmsteads were being abandoned by families in fear of becoming the next macabre recollection shared amongst terrified neighbors and townspeople. It seemed to many that, for all intents and purposes, there was no way to effectively combat a force who struck in lightning quick raids and seemed to disappear into the western landscape just as quickly. The situation presented such a novel problem, it seemed only a novel solution would suffice. In the decades prior, small forces under the directive of Secretary of State Stephen F. Austin had patrolled the ranges of the Texas frontier with the intention of finding and engaging the Comanche. It was hoped that a more offensive approach might dissuade further attacks. But the ranging companies, who would come to be known as the Texas Rangers, have managed to achieve only marginal success in tracking down and engaging the Comanche. They are perpetually underfunded, poorly equipped, and their ranks are made up of young men who largely have found no place in other parts of society. Most are men under the age of 25, who have come to Texas for the express purpose of violence and retribution. Every year, young men ride into San Antonio and eagerly sign on with the Rangers, boasting of all the Comanche scalps they are soon to take and of all the beautiful Texas maidens they would soon rescue. They would ride out of town at the first mention of a nearby Comanche attack, resplendent in all their martial glory, only to never be seen again. For the lucky among them, death would come quickly in battle, by the 14-foot Comanche lances and stocky, short arrows that whipped through the air with enough velocity to pass through the torso of a buffalo bull and stick into the hard prairie ground. For the unfortunate souls unlucky enough to be taken prisoner, 
their ends would not come so quickly. Many a young ranger would meet a prolonged, painful demise at the hands of Comanche torturers. For years, their success in pursuing Comanche raiding parties and preventing atrocities on the Texas frontier was a sporadic affair. Occasionally, they had been fortuitous enough to surprise a Comanche camp and rescue a captive or two, but they had continually struggled to match their adversaries in mobility and in the volume of fire they were able to amass. By 1845, however, this is beginning to change because of two critical factors now working in the Rangers' favor. The first is the advent of the Rangers' adoption of the Colt Patterson Revolver. Designed by New Jersey inventor Samuel Colt, the Colt Patterson is the precursor to the six-shot Colt Walker Revolver that would come out two years later in 1847. Named after its inventor in his hometown of Patterson, New Jersey, the Colt Patterson boasts a five-shot cylinder and an imposingly large build. The five shots have to be loaded into the cylinder, and the cylinder would have to be detached to reload, necessitating that a ranger in the field keep several preloaded cylinders on his person. While it does not have the ease of use, capacity, nor firepower of its successor, the Colt Patterson is a revolutionary weapon. However, years after its invention, the Colt Patterson had been relegated to relative obscurity, as there was no military or law enforcement force who yet knew how to best employ the new weapon. Texas had first ordered 180 of the new revolvers from Colt, intending them for use by the New Republic's Navy. However, the Navy was never able to employ them to any meaningful ends, and thus the technology seemed destined for the proverbial scrap heap. However, before the Texas government gives up hope on the utility of the Colt Patterson, they decide that perhaps the Rangers might be able to employ them. While this may seem an obvious conclusion to draw in hindsight, the notion of mounted gunmen attacking the Comanche in the same manner the Comanche attacked them was an essentially foreign notion. For centuries, as Americans had made their dogged advance eastward, combat against the native tribes of the eastern woodlands had involved fighting on foot. The terrain often did not lend itself to fighting from horseback. Furthermore, the rifles and muskets used by the Americans and their predecessors necessitated a lengthy, cumbersome reloading process that was next to impossible while riding atop a horse at full gallop. This gap in tactical prowess has allowed the Comanche to operate largely unfettered, as they are able to maneuver their mounts and unleash arrows at a rate the average Texan simply cannot match while footbound and firing sporadically from a single-shot weapon. But now, with the advent of a repeating weapon that can be fired multiple times before reloading and can be operated from horseback, the odds are becoming more favorable for the Rangers. But while the rangers in general are a motley, combative lot, often prone to drunkenness and using coarse language, they have for too long lacked a leader with a clear, present vision on how to turn the tide against their Comanche foe. But in the last few years, a young Tennessean, with boyish looks and a seemingly unshakable demeanor, has been ascending the ranger ranks. The progeny of a family with a long military tradition, he had come to Texas in the 1830s, narrowly missing his chance to serve in the Texas Revolution of 1836-37. and 37. He had, instead, taken up work as part of a surveyor party, perhaps the most dangerous job in Texas at the time. The Comanche were well aware of surveyor parties, and had surmised that their purpose was to measure out the allotments of their land that the Texas government was unjustly giving away. Thus, surveillance parties were subject to some of the most gruesome tortures the Comanche practiced. From being staked out alive on the plains, to be eaten by wild animals and burned by the sun, to heaping hot coals upon the unfortunate victim's torso. He had managed to avoid such unfortunate fates and was able to sign on with the Texas Rangers. For the last several years, he has been working his way through the Rangers' ranks. His name is John Coffey Hayes, better known as Jack Hayes. He will prove to be the second important factor in changing the way the Rangers fight. In a world of the big-bodied ruffians that comprise most of the ranger forces, Hayes stands out for both his slender build and his civilized manners. He has a calm, high-toned voice, dark hair, and the cool, calculating eyes of a dyed-in-the-wool killer. Time and time again over the preceding years, the rangers in Hayes' company have marveled at his ability to switch instantaneously from an affable, thoughtful conversationalist to a snarling, myopically focused combat leader. The times he has put himself in mortal danger from enemy fire, all while doling out concise, clear orders to the rangers in his command, seem too numerous to count by this point in his career. For months now, 
Hayes and his rangers have been in San Antonio, setting off occasionally to patrol the surrounding territory and training incessantly with their new revolvers. Time and again, each ranger rides through an obstacle course of sorts while firing at targets set on fence posts. Hayes drills the men until not only they, but their horses are fully comfortable with the demands of combat conducted on horseback. Some of the rangers gripe quietly that they are tired of the incessant drilling, but all of them know the time for them to employ their skills is close at hand. That time finally comes late in the afternoon of the day the unfortunate homesteaders are killed. Hayes receives word that, yet again, the Comanches have wrought their particular brand of havoc on the surrounding countryside. He is informed that the impending raiding party is on their way west, towards the Frio River. Within minutes, Hayes and a party of 42 rangers have assembled at the western edge of the city of San Antonio. Hayes briefs them on the specifics of the route he intends to take, and informs the men, much to their satisfaction, that their intent is to catch up with the Comanche, kill as many as possible, and recover the horses they have stolen. The rangers ride hard, knowing that with the small size of their force and the Comanche's cumbersome number of warriors and horses, they can very well catch up to the Comanche before they are able to disperse onto the vast expanses of West Texas. Riding with them, as is often the case, is a native scout. He is a Lipan Apache chief named Flacco, and he may be the linchpin to this entire ranger operation. Chief Flacco has grown up combating the Comanche, as they were, at least for varying periods of the 19th century, mortal enemies to his tribe. He has stayed in and around San Antonio for the last several years, and by this time has built a strong friendship with Jack Hayes. The two men, both warriors and leaders of men, have an immense, enduring respect for each other. It is Chief Flacco who has encouraged Hayes to fight the Comanche on their own terms. Now, his tracking ability, far more honed and refined than even the most astute rangers, will make the critical difference in whether the rangers will even find the Comanche raiding party. After traveling roughly 60 miles, though, the entire party can sense that the Comanche are close. Finally, as they come within sight of the Frio River, the rangers spot the Comanche. Seemingly simultaneously, the Comanche spot them. Thinking a force of several dozen to be no match for their force of two to three hundred, the Comanche form a battle line between the rangers and the horses, and prepare to receive a ranger attack. For their part, the rangers know that there is not a second to lose. They have trained to engage the Comanche on the Comanche's terms, and this meant that the time to launch a full-scale, head-on attack was now. At the time the two parties see each other, Hayes is riding on a mule towards the rear of the ranger column. Now aware of the urgency of an immediate attack, Hayes spurs his mount forward as fast as possible. On his way towards the front, he comes upon another ranger on a fine horse who looks to be reining his mount in in order to keep him from charging forward at full speed. Hayes calls out to the man to hurry forward, but the ranger insists that the horse is trying to run away with him, and it is all he can do to keep the horse from galloping away completely uncontrolled. Hayes, in a rush to get to the front of the column and dubious of the man's claims, insists that they switch mounts. The ranger takes over the mule while Hayes jumps astride the skittish horse. Almost at the instant Hayes touches down in the saddle, the horse is off in a full sprint towards the front, paying no heed to the directives of the range, the stirrups, nor Hayes' shouts. The front of the column, with their revolvers drawn and teeth bared, are now charging forward towards the Comanche line. In the lead, eager to engage the Comanche, is Chief Flacco. As he rides, he sees Hayes fly by, riding at full speed past the front of the ranger column. He has no idea that Hayes is aboard a runaway horse and assumes that his friend's near suicidal penchant for bravery in combat has reached a new, inexplicable, and ill-advised level. The chief, a proud warrior himself, decides in an instant that he will not let his friend ride off to certain death alone, nor will he let a Texan steal all the glory in combat against his hated enemy. Chief Flacco urges his horse on, faster and faster, until it is just himself and Hayes between the charging rangers to their rear and the two to three hundred strong column of Comanche warriors to their front. Both men, now committed to the attack, begin to fire their revolvers as the ground rapidly closes between themselves and the Comanche. To the rangers riding behind them, this charge the two men have undertaken seems suicidal. Death, for both men, despite their gallantry, seems imminent. 
but the Comanche are so astounded by the reckless bravery of the charge, they suffer a momentary bout of paralysis by analysis, unsure of what exactly is happening. This brief lapse in vigilance means that Hayes and Flacco, instead of crashing into a hail of bullets and arrows, merely rush through the lines of their adversaries. The Rangers, still charging in a force 41 strong towards the Comanche, seize the opportunity presented by a confounded enemy and pour fire into the Comanche ranks. Much in the fashion of the Comanche, they make several whirlwind attacks striking the Comanche lines and then retracting before striking again. Hayes and Flacco are able to flank the Comanche and make their way back to the Ranger forces in time to inflict casualties of their own against the warriors. The Comanche put up a hellacious fight for a time, but are overwhelmed by the volume of fire this small contingent is able to inflict upon them. Finally, the Comanche break ranks, and in the words of J.W. Wilbarger in his 1889 work, Indian Depredations in Texas, a panic at length seized them, and they fled and scattered in every direction. After the fight, as many horses as can be recovered are rounded up and the party returns to San Antonio. Chief Flacco, in part astonished by his friend's bravery and in part amused that the charge had been the result of a panicked horse, bestowed a lasting nickname upon the captain that would be known to his friends and enemies alike. From that day on the Frio River Ford, Captain Hayes will be known to many in Texas as Bravo Too Much or Brave Too Much. The name certainly has a tinge of good-natured ribbing between friends, but its meaning is also starkly serious and, as time will prove again and again, inarguably apt. Chief Flacco and Jack Hayes will go on to many more fights against the Comanche, and Hayes will carve out his own brutal legacy in the battlefields of the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1847. He will eventually move to California with the advent of the 1849 Gold Rush, and the two old friends will never see each other again. Flacco would go on to become a legendary figure in Texas history whose story deserves an episode all its own. But the bloody war for control of Texas is not over. It will in fact carry on for decades more and see countless lives lost on both sides, and ultimately the end of the Comanche's way of life. But the innumerable accounts of the heroics and villainy wrought by Texans and Comanches alike are, for tonight, other stories for other times. San Antonio, Texas, summer, 1841. In the faint light of dawn, a group of 35 horsemen, composed of 20 Mexican citizens and 15 Texas Rangers, are saddling their horses and checking their weapons. The men are angry, indignant, and thirsting for vengeance. Throughout the previous spring, they have lost countless head of cattle and horses, seen their homes ransacked and burned, and, in some cases, seen their loved ones cut down in front of their eyes. Despite the tenuous relationship between Texas and Mexico at the time, this group has followed the age-old adage that the enemy of one's enemy is one's friend. These Anglo-Texans and native-born Mexicans, along with their Lipan Apache native guides, ride now as brothers in arms against their collective enemy, the Comanche. They now unify around the singular intent of their joint mission, retaking the horses that had been most recently stolen from ranches all around San Antonio, as well as killing or capturing any and all Comanche that they can. The group assembles and rides out of town, heading southwest in the direction the Comanche raiders have last been seen. The rangers, though comprising the minority of the overall force, are the most experienced in tracking and fighting the Comanche, and are assigned to lead this retributive expedition. Though they themselves have only existed for a little over half of a decade, they have amassed considerable combat time against the Comanche. They, along with their native guides, had been amongst the incredibly rare few who had fought the Comanche in their own proverbial backyard with any measure of success. Even then, they had not been able to stem the tide of violence that was washing over the whole of central Texas by way of incessant, horrific Comanche raiding. The intensity and severity of these attacks were unlike anything anyone in Texas, from the native tribes like the Tonkawa, Karankawa, Waco, and Apache, to the Spanish, to the Mexicans, to the Texians, 
had ever seen before. Many times at desolate locations throughout the beautiful but unforgiving Texas frontier, whole villages, families, and farmsteads were simply wiped out. The Comanche had, for centuries, suffered the slings and arrows of oppression at the hands of the more organized, wealthier, and simply more fortunate tribes. Their ascension had come only with their introduction to the horse, via the raiding of and trading with the Spanish. However, once this serendipitous meeting had occurred, the Comanche's rise to power happened with perhaps more intensity and more rapidity than had ever been seen by any tribe on the North American continent before. The Comanche mastered horsemanship, horse trading, horse stealing, and were one of the few tribes to selectively breed the animals. Unlike most tribes that American or Mexican forces had encountered up to this point in 1841, the Comanche also fought from horseback. Raids often took place on full moon nights, an occurrence that became so frequent that a full moon in central Texas became known as a Comanche moon. Unsuspecting settlers or villagers from rival tribes would awake to a cyclone of violence and terror that few would live to tell about. Mounted Comanche warriors who had made their way from base camps sometimes hundreds of miles away would suddenly swoop down on their targets, seeking to take all they could and kill anyone who might try to stop them. All men would generally be killed on sight, or else taken prisoner and summarily tortured to death as equal parts retribution and entertainment. Women would be taken prisoner and generally be used as slaves both sexual and otherwise. Infants would, in general, be killed outright as their crying and constant need for care presented too much of a liability and inconvenience for a raiding party on the move to trouble themselves with. This pattern had been repeated ad nauseum for decades and, for the most part, no one had been able to do anything about it. The masterful general and politician Juan Batista de Anza had managed to broker a peace with the Comanche in New Mexico in the late 18th century, but it had not extended to the Texas frontier. The Spanish government had been long exasperated by its inability to settle any consequential amount of territory north of San Antonio since the city's founding in 1718. They had seen their soldiers and settlers, as well as their priests and missions, fall victim time and again to levels of violence that they had never encountered before. The Mexican government that had taken power after the signing of the Treaty of Cordoba in 1821 had found themselves just as perplexed as their predecessors on how to stem the tide of Comanche violence. In the Comanche, they had found not so much another native tribe to be either exterminated or driven out, but a rival empire with whom they had found themselves perpetually unable to compete. The seasonal attacks caused not only intermittent destruction, but a pervasive fear amongst the citizens of Mexico from San Antonio all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula. The Mexican government's solution was to install a buffer zone of Anglo settlers on the Texas frontier to absorb the brunt of the Comanche violence and hopefully spare their citizenry further south such troubles. But this solution was found wanting when the settlers thoroughly fed up with the lack of support from the Mexican government, began to foment a spirit of rebellion amongst the settler population in Texas. This became a significant contributing factor in the Texians' ultimate rebellion against the Mexican government, which resulted in the Texas Revolution lasting from October 2, 1835 to April 21, 1836. The Texians would ultimately win their independence from the Mexican government only to find themselves facing an even bigger challenge in stemming the tide of Comanche attacks that bedeviled virtually the entirety of the territory, from the Gulf of Mexico to present-day Oklahoma. Their solution was to employ mobile companies of light cavalry who would police the open ranges of the Texas frontier. This was the genesis of the Texas Rangers. To be sure, the concept of ranging companies was not a wholly new one even in the 1840s. The term ranger traces its etymology back to the 1590s, 
in which it initially described a rover or wanderer. However, the term had evolved by the 1660s to describe a mounted man or force of men who policed a large area of land. Even in their earliest iterations, the Texas Rangers sparked a nerve in the collective consciousness of the time, lending themselves to great tales of daring and do recounted from newspapers and dime novels in parlor rooms as far away as New York and London. But for all their vaunted martial prowess, the Rangers had, at least at first, struggled greatly. Their ranks were composed mostly of young men in their early twenties, many of whom had come to Texas for the express purposes of fighting, killing, combat, and adventure. They had fought and killed Mexican troops and citizens alike, chased down and brutally punished cattle thieves and murderers, and instilled their brand of frontier justice wherever they had seen fit. But of all their enemies, of whom there were many, it was the Comanche who had inflicted the greatest losses upon their already small ranks. In some of the earliest years of combating the Comanche, the ranger fatality rate was recorded as being up to 50%. Those not fortunate enough to be killed outright were subjected to torturous fates. However, those who had survived had continued to hone their skills as a mobile attack force that could strike deep into enemy territory. They had seen their friends and comrades die in horrific ways in remote locations, with few to remember that they ever existed and they were loath to let the lessons that they had learned from this go unused. They had continued to refine their techniques in writing and shooting, developing and drilling new recruits in shooting on the move from atop a galloping horse. They had developed their weaponry, moving from single-shot pistols to five-shot revolvers with reloadable cylinders. The selective effect of consistent, intensive combat inevitably culled the already stalwart ranger forces into a Spartan-esque group of highly experienced and highly motivated frontier killers. Though they were certainly held in high esteem by the Texas settlers and citizens they were charged with protecting, the Texas Rangers in 1841 were known as rough men who, without the outlet of their profession, would have found no place in civilized society. The Rangers had no formalized uniform nor any code of grooming or dress. They wore whatever they pleased and found most practical in the Texas weather and terrain. Oftentimes the average ranger might wear buckskin leggings with a cotton shirt and a wide-brimmed hat. Still others might wear a serape and coonskin cap. They were often not terribly concerned with record-keeping, journaling, nor the popular literature of the day. They were known to intermittently fight and kill each other with their bowie knives and revolvers in drunken quarrels. With their bowie knives and revolvers in drunken quarrels. They were, by most accounts, more analogous to a modern-day biker gang than anything resembling a metropolitan police force today. Many had unkempt hair, long beards, and spoke coarsely. It was no small wonder, then, that they pledged their seemingly unwavering allegiance and obedience to a well-kempt, high-voiced, and slightly-built Tennessean who was scarcely 24 years old. His name was John Coffey Hayes, better known as Jack Hayes. He had been born in Little Cedar Lake, Tennessee, into a proud military family. His father, Harmon A. Hayes, had fought under Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. He had given his son the middle name Coffey after John R. Coffey, a family relative and an officer at the Battle of New Orleans. He had made his way to Texas in 1836 in hopes of participating in the Texas Revolution, but, having arrived too late to do so, had found work as a land surveyor instead. This was perhaps the most dangerous job in the territory at the time. It involved venturing out into the vast expanses of the seemingly empty, seemingly unclaimed spaces of the Texas frontier to demarcate boundaries of land plots ostensibly belonging to their new republic. But as everyone in Texas well knew, the territories west of San Antonio and the new capital of Austin were neither empty nor unclaimed. 
This land belonged to an empire that, at its height, dwarfed the size and scope of anything the Texans could legitimately lay claim to. It belonged to the Comanche, and it was known as Comancheria. To set foot in these territories without explicit permission of the Comanche was to put one's life in very real, very immediate danger. The Comanche had long observed survey parties sent out by the Spanish and Mexicans and knew what their purpose and intentions were. These were the men who snuck into their lands to divvy them up and sell them off to the Comanche's hated enemies. Thus, many a surveyor met his end staked out to the Texas dirt, as Comanche warriors heaped burning coals upon his stomach and mocked his cries of pain and torment. Hayes, however, had been undeterred by the risks. He had been recruited into the ranger forces for both his demonstrable traits as well as his military pedigree, and worked his way up through their ranks in short order. While stationed near San Antonio, Hayes had become good friends with a Lipan Apache chief named Flacco. In their many conversations, Flacco had demonstrated in detail the tactics of the Comanche as opposed to other tribes such as the Apache or Waco. The Comanche attacked in cyclonic formations that saw a ring of riders rotate its way towards their target. Every time a warrior reached the point in his rotation where he was nearest the target, he would loose his arrow before his path continued to carry him to the rear of the formation, granting him time to reload and strike again on his next turn. Hayes employed Chief Flacco often in hunting down raiding parties and used the invaluable intel he had gathered from the chief in combating the Comanche on their own terms in their own territory. His reputation had grown not only amongst the Texians and Mexicans, but amongst the Comanche as well. They deemed him heap brave, and referred to him as Captain Jack, which they pronounced Cap'n Yak, or Bravo Too Much, meaning Too Brave. Many a bounty had been placed on his head by Comanche war chiefs and Mexican officers, who described him as an irascible devil. The accounts of friends and foes alike describe Hayes' normally affable, genteel manner, which seemed instantly transformed at the first call to arms. His dark eyes would become icy cold, his posture would become all at once commanding, and his distinctive, high-toned voice would become crystal clear and calm in doling out orders whose consequences would result in the men under his command living or dying. He was described as intensely concerned with the well-being of his men, but nearly suicidal in his disregard of his own as arrows and bullets flew Shrieks rang out, and bodies fell all around him. These traits had garnered the young man not only the accolades of promotion within the ranger ranks, but the unwavering loyalty of those in his charge. And so it was on this hot summer morning, as Hayes led his band of rangers and Mexican gunmen in their pursuit of their mutual enemy. Leaving San Antonio, the party makes their way west, tracking the raiding party to the mouth of Uvalde Canyon just over 80 miles from San Antonio. On July 1st, they finally come within sight of the Comanche. Knowing that time is of the essence if they are to maintain the ever-critical element of surprise, Hayes and his men make an immediate attack on the band of Comanches, roughly a dozen strong. The Comanche, for all their prowess in offense, often let discretion be the better part of valor in the face of surprise attacks. This case is no exception as the Comanche warriors, along with one of their women, scatter into a nearby thicket. Hayes, leading the attack, brings his horse to a stop, while seemingly simultaneously stepping off the animal's back and charging into the thicket without breaking stride. Two of Hayes's ranger comrades do the same, and the three men pursue their quarry headlong into the dense thicket. A volley of arrows flies towards them, with most of them sticking into tree trunks or bouncing off of limbs. They are, however, effective enough in deterring the ranger's attack as all three men are hit. One of the men is grievously wounded, the other seriously wounded but still mobile, and Hayes has suffered a painful but comparatively minor wound to one of his fingers. 
Hayes directs the most seriously wounded ranger to take cover as best he can, while he gets their mobile comrade to the comparative safety of their battle line. Hayes manages to do this, then returns to the thicket with a double-barreled shotgun in order to retrieve his more critically wounded ranger cohort. Of the twelve Comanche warriors in the thicket, only one is armed with a rifle, the rest being armed with bows, arrows, tomahawks, and knives. Against one wounded man with a shotgun and another nearly dead man with a pistol, this would normally be an unremarkable challenge for the Comanche, even within the restrictive confines of the thicket. Incensed at the ranger's rude interruption, the Comanche gather into a battle line and begin their attack, ripping through the limbs and brush, intending to swoop down on Hayes' position and end this troublesome, arrogant Texian once and for all. Jack Hayes, however, intends to kill all the Comanche he can, and, should they not kill him, get his wounded comrade to safety. He waits an agonizingly long several seconds until the Comanche charge is within 15 feet of he and his fellow ranger's position, before suddenly rising and coolly squeezing off shotgun blasts into the two closest warriors. Then, with the second shot still ringing in the air, Hayes drops the shotgun to the ground and draws his revolver. However, the two shots from the shotgun, as well as the visual of the damage done to their comrades, has been enough to dissuade the Comanches from their assault. This provides Hayes the proverbial window he needs to drag his fellow ranger to safety. He directs the men not caring for the wounded to encircle the thicket and shoot any Comanche who attempts to flee. Hayes then obtains a rifle and several freshly loaded cylinders for his revolver, before sprinting back into the thicket, alone. Hayes hunkers down into the same position he had left, with the stench of blood and gun smoke still heavy in the air. For the next three hours, Hayes proceeds to pick off the Comanche, one by one, as attack after attack is made only to be driven back by the accuracy and rapidity of Hayes's fire. Finally, as the late afternoon sun begins its languid descent into the west, there are only two men left alive in the thicket, Hayes and a Comanche warrior, as well as one Comanche woman. Ten of the Comanche's fellow tribesmen with whom they had traveled so far, and only this morning shared the warmth of their campfire and comfort of a good meal with, now lie strewn about this isolated thicket, their lifeblood drained into the caliche dirt. The last Comanche warrior, knowing he is surrounded and escape is all but impossible, resigns himself to his fate. He sings his death song, which echoes off the canyon walls in haunting refrains. The warrior then steals his mind, informs the lone woman left with him that she will be taken prisoner soon and that she must conduct herself honorably and stay strong under the cruel yoke of the Texian intruders. Then. He takes a deep breath, knocks one of his arrows, and begins to maneuver his way towards Hayes's position, intent on at least taking his pound of flesh from the Texians before entering the next world. Hayes, now sweat-soaked and covered in dust and blood, has been waiting. Though he has managed to kill all ten of this warrior's comrades, he knows the fight is not over until either all of the Comanche are dead, or he is. Again, Hayes hunkers down as the thudding of footsteps and crashing of limbs nears his position. Finally, when the last warrior comes within fifteen feet of his position, Hayes rises and takes aim. This time, though, he does not manage to get off a shot before his enemy. The Comanche looses his arrow at the same instant Hayes' revolver sends out a cacophonous retort. The arrow whips through the air, grazing Hayes' shoulder and knocking him to his back. The Comanche warrior is struck in the torso, but continues his attack, knife in hand. Hayes manages to pounce to his feet, and with the warrior mere feet away, empty his remaining four shots into the Comanche, ending his last fight for good. The woman is taken prisoner, the horses recovered, and the Comanche's bodies left to the desecrations of the wolves and coyotes. Hayes would go on to many more fights with not only the Comanche, but with the Mexican army, the Apache, and even the Paiute. 
he would ultimately move to San Francisco, where he would be named sheriff and amass a substantial fortune via ranching and real estate. Until his dying day, he would retain the respect of many of his staunchest former enemies, so much so that, upon hearing of the birth of Hayes' first son, the Comanche chief Buffalo Hump sent the ranger captain a golden spoon as a gift for his new baby. Hayes would go on to become one of the original members of the city of Oakland. He would ultimately pass away at the age of 66 and is buried at the Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland, California. The Comanche, though they had borne the brunt of this particular engagement, would go on to expand their empire, living as lords of the Southern Plains until the 1870s, when they were finally relegated to the doldrums, discontent, and perpetual disrespect of reservation life. The fight for Texas, perhaps more so than any territory in the whole of North America, was a bloody, unforgiving, grief-soaked, and violence-driven affair. The tales of triumph, tragedy, hopes gained, and lives lost are too numerous to cover in one episode. And while all are tales worth remembering, for tonight, they are other stories for other times. Fall, 1841, Enchanted Rock, Central Texas. On a crisp fall afternoon, a small group of land surveyors under the employ of the Republic of Texas made their way through the territory near what is today Fredericksburg, Texas. They have been sent out here some 95 miles west of Austin to survey and legally demarcate land grants and territorial claims. Though this job came with a seemingly banal description, this was perhaps, at the time, the most dangerous line of work in the world. Not because the act of land surveillance was particularly hazardous, but because, in 1841, this was very possibly the most dangerous place on earth. And it was so very dangerous because it was the territory of perhaps the most feared tribe on the continent. They called themselves the Nomuro, which simply meant the people, a self-referential catch-all term that is not uncommon in tribal names. Tribes like the Apache, the Waco, the Tawankoni, the Tonkawa, and countless other small Texas tribes whom they had been warring with for decades knew them by another name. They knew them as the Comanche. This is thought to be a derivation of a Ute phrase meaning those who fight us all the time. The name may have come from one of their longtime enemies, but it was apt. The Comanche had migrated down to the plains of Texas and Oklahoma after being unable to sustain their livelihoods as hunter-gatherers in the northern Rocky Mountains. They had been an offshoot of the Shoshone tribe, who for centuries had barely subsisted in the unforgiving environs of the Rockies granite ranges and aspen forests, until they were finally forced out by stronger tribes. They suffered greatly as they perpetually downtrodden, and had only begun their ascent to martial prowess when they encountered the animal brought over by the Spanish in the 16th century, the horse. The Spanish had closely guarded the secrets of horsemanship and caretaking of the animals, knowing all too well the potential for disaster should their adversaries turned subjects ever be able to combat them from horseback en masse. But despite their precautionary efforts, after the decades of raiding from the surrounding tribes, the absconding of natives who had been trained in horsemanship and care in order to serve their Spanish overlords, and the inevitable cultural mixing that comes from proximity, a sizable number of their mounts, as well as a sizable amount of their institutional equine knowledge, had spread to the southern plains. Though the Apache had been the first to introduce the horse in any meaningful capacity to the Texas frontier, it would be the Comanche who, for reasons that have been often described as too ethereal to quantify, possessed an innate an undeniably palpable connection to the horse. Within a few decades of their exposure to the horse, they had not only mastered riding skills to rival most any horseman on the planet, but it completely transformed their way of life. Once their days had been spent scouring the spare countryside in search of roots, berries, and scavengeable carcasses for salvageable protein. Now they were a society of highly mobile and masterful hunters 
who existed almost entirely on the flesh of the buffalo that their new steeds enabled them to kill so readily. Where once they had been bereft of material wealth, they were now quite possibly the wealthiest tribe on the whole of the American continent in terms of horse flesh. And where once they had been the proverbial whipping boy of their neighbors, they had transformed into a fighting and raiding force whose mere mention would insert a pregnant, fearful pause in conversations from Denver saloons to the Capitol building in Mexico City. They had driven the Apache out of Texas, foresawed Spanish, French, English, Mexican, and American expansion for centuries, and wiped smaller tribes who had opposed them out entirely. Though the frontier had always been a brutal place, both pre- and post-European contact, the Comanche had been waging warfare of an intensity and scale that had rarely, if ever, been seen before. Comanche raiding entailed not only the taking of coup, nor, at least not initially, the adornment of its warriors in highly ceremonial dress. They had no formal stratification to their martial society, as nominal war chiefs were simply those who were able to marshal the most men for the raids that they proposed. Comanche warfare was simply a brutally violent, ruthlessly pragmatic affair. Until the latter half of the 19th century, many Comanche warriors eschewed large feathered headdresses in favor of animal headcaps made from foxes, cranes, or buffalo. They were often simply painted pitch black, which they believed to be the color of death. Raids were often conducted during full moons, so much so that a full moon was known throughout the Texas frontier as a Comanche moon, and was a much dreaded sight. And this was for good reason, as, on many a full moon night, isolated families of both settlers and natives had seen their whole worlds destroyed in a matter of minutes, gone in a torrent of blood, smoke, and flames. The new Republic of Texas, ironically, in many ways owed its existence to the ever-present threat of Comanche raiding. The Mexican government, their governing predecessors had hoped to install a buffler of Anglo-immigrant settlers who would bear the brunt of the Comanche onslaught before it could reach further south into Mexico. For decades, prospective settlers from America had flooded into Texas from the east on condition that they convert to Catholicism and become Mexican citizens. Many had come, and many had died brutally hard deaths in their search for better lives. Despite the cost, settlement attempts from Mexicans and Texans alike, from the Rio Grande Valley to present-day Fort Worth, persisted. And thus, so did Comanche raiding. However, despite the incessant threat of violence, the Texas government was faced with the routine administrative tasks that befall all bureaucracies, including marking out plots of its newly won, at least through their eyes, homeland. And so, Surveying parties of 15 to 20 men scattered out across the Texas Hill Country northwest of San Antonio and Austin. They would keep descriptive logs of the land they covered, survey prospective plots, and, hopefully, return to the capital in Austin to provide a clearer picture of Texas's newly won territories. However, any interlopers into the territory west of the major Texas settlements were likely always under the watchful eye of the true rulers of the land the Comanche. The Comanche had observed the surveying parties from the start, knew that they were the means by which the white men in Austin were laying claim to their lands, and, accordingly, hated them with an unfettered passion. Surveying parties were targeted with especially harsh, unremittent attacks. The Comanche preference was to take them alive and reserve their most sadistic tortures for them. Yet still, they came. Young men from the backwoods of Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Alabama flooded into the state after the Texas Revolution. Many had just missed the bloodshed of the battles of Goliath, the Alamo, and San Jacinto, and were now thirsting for a fight. For many, the dangers of being part of a surveyor team presented an enticing employment option. Such was the case for this party of young Texians here in the shadow of the limestone monolith that is Enchanted Rock. For time immemorial, 
enchanted rock had been considered sacred by the tribes in the area. It was said to be the home of discontented spirits, from slain warriors to shamed chiefs. It was said that the native tribes practiced sacrifices at its base, and it was well known that any incursion into the territory surrounding Enchanted Rock would be met with the utmost of hostilities. However, the ever-present threat of violent, painful ends were not enough to dissuade this group of combat-hungry twenty-somethings who had come to Texas for the express purpose of tempting such a fate. For all their bluster and bravado, though, these newly minted Texans were no fools. This party of 15 to 20 surveyors were among the most well-armed men on the planet at the time. Many of them carried the 36 caliber Colt Patterson revolver. Considered by many firearm collectors to be a seminal pistol in Old West history, it had been patented by Samuel Colt in 1836 and produced in Patterson, New Jersey, hence the name Colt Patterson. It had been originally calibered in a 28 caliber pistol, but had been changed to a 36 caliber in 1837. It held five shots as opposed to today's usual six, and was loaded by detaching the cylinder, manually loading the cartridges, and then reassembling to fire. This meant that a combatant would have to preload several five-shot cylinders and would be relegated to relatively cumbersome reloading processes in comparison to later models. The weapon weighed in at 2 pounds, 12 ounces, with a 9-inch barrel. This made it a very large, very loud, and, understandably, terrifying weapon to enemy combatants. With an effective range of roughly 65 yards, it was well suited to the horseback, high-speed, up-close fighting that was the new norm on the Texas frontier. For longer range endeavors, Many of the Texans were armed with the 42 caliber Edwin Wesson percussion cap rifles. In short, these are single shot rifles that use small copper caps filled with mercuric fulminate as the ignition source to fire their projectiles. The small copper cap is placed on a plug under the hammer of the rifle, and when the hammer is released, the percussion ignites the mercuric fulminate, causing it to fire. These rifles were highly effective at ranges up to 150 yards and could be fired at a slightly faster rate than their flintlock predecessors at up to three to four rounds per minute. These advancements in weaponry had come at a fortuitous time for the Texans, particularly for those in the land surveillance parties and for the organization from which Stephen F. Austin so often chose to draw his land surveillance parties, the still young but already legendary Texas Rangers. It had been Stephen F. Austin himself, the legendary Texas statesman, whom the state capital is named after, who had fostered the original concept for the predecessors of the Rangers in the 1830s, the Texas Mounted Rifles. Born largely of necessity, the Mounted Rifles patrolled the ranges of the Texas frontier, presented the only available organized resistance against the Mexican governmental harassment, banditry, and Comanche raiding. In 1835, the organization had been codified into a state-sponsored military-slash-law-enforcement hybrid force uniquely capable of close-quarter combat and long-distance pursuit. In the intervening years, their legend had grown from the dusty settlements of Texas to the finest parlors of New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia. The Rangers presented virtually the only consequential resistance to the violence that plagued the flatland prairies, river valley bottoms, and hill country homesteads. The tales of their daring and ferocity spread like wildfire amongst not only Texans, Mexicans, and Americans, but amongst the Comanche as well. And perhaps none among the rangers, and their ranks full of giant, strapping, bellicose young men, garnered more respect or more fear than did Captain John Coffee Hayes. He had been born in Little Cedar Lick, Tennessee, in 1817 to a military family. His father, Harmon A. Hayes, had fought in the War of 1812 under Andrew Jackson. Harmon named his son after Jackson's legendary Brigadier General, John Coffey. John Coffey Hayes, known by those close to him as Jack, had made his way to Texas in 1836 at the age of 19 in search of fortune, adventure, and war. Though he had missed his chance to participate in the Texas Revolution, 
he had found a home with the Texas Rangers. The Rangers had a casualty rate that at times reached 50%, and it was assumed that a fair number of their fresh-faced recruits who proudly rode out of San Antonio and Austin would never be seen again. Even in the austere, hyper-violent world of the Rangers, though, Jack Hayes stood out. In an occupation replete with large, burly men, he was a slender 5'6", 20-something, with a boyish face and a quiet, affable demeanor. But one look at his eyes, even from today's vantage point, more than a century and a half removed, and it is apparent that the man was no slave to fear. His affable demeanor and unremarkable stature were, in countless eyewitness accounts, transformed into the striking and irrefutable figure of the unshakable, irascible Uber Ranger. The one who feared no hardship, thrived in the chaos of combat, and possessed an innate and undeniable ability to lead men who had proven otherwise ungovernable by the vast majority of society. His legend had spread far and wide through Texas, even in the short time he had been there in 1841, and this made him an ideal member for the surveying party Stephen F. Austin needed to send out to Enchanted Rock. And so it was that Jack Hayes, legendary ranger, found himself here at Enchanted Rock on this fall afternoon. As the survey team set about their laborious tasks of unspooling a few hundred yards of steel ribbon and then demarcating its location on a map, Hayes and a number of other ranger companions stood watch. At some point during their endeavors, though, Hayes decided to ride out toward Enchanted Rock to procure a better up-close view of the legendary landmark. Thinking himself secure as no Comanche had been spotted in the area, Hayes rode off alone. However, in an example of just how cunning and tactically brilliant the Comanche truly were, even the experienced ranger and his cohorts had failed to notice a sizable number of warriors trailing them. Hayes' departure from the main party was just the opportunity the force of Comanche had been waiting for as they lay watching in the overlooking limestone cliffs and oak-strewn hills. As Hayes neared the base of the rock, even his conditioned nervous system must have received a notable shock when the sound of Comanche war whoops cracked the still of the afternoon air. His brain, also highly conditioned to the rigors of fast-paced frontier combat, also likely surmised, almost instantaneously, that he had no hope of retreating to his party of fellow Texans before being caught and overrun by the Comanche. Now, quite literally caught between a rock and a hard place, Hayes rode hard to the base of Enchanted Rock, dismounted, and began a desperate, dogged scramble up the face. His intent was to gain himself a position on the highest ground in the area, and, in the words of author J.W. Wilbarger in Indian Depredations in Texas, see link in description, Hayes was determined to sell his life at the highest market price. Hayes's reputation, combined with his notable dark hair and moderate stature, made him a prized target among the ranks of the Comanche, and he was pursued up the side of the giant rock with the utmost gusto by several warriors intent on harvesting his scalp. However, Hayes had managed to ensconce himself in a crevice in the limestone and construct a haphazard defensive position. Here, he hunkered down with his 42 caliber rifle, aimed outward toward his pursuers, and two Colt Patterson revolvers in a holster on either hip. A less experienced frontier fighter might have made a fatal tactical miscalculation at this juncture as the Comanche pressed their initial attack upon Hayes's position. As reliable and powerful as the Wesson percussion rifle may have been, it was still a single-shot weapon. This meant that any defender in Hayes's position would have essentially one shot on his pursuers, one that they must make count. After that, they would be forced to complete a loading process that would enable their enemy to close the gap between their positions and capture or kill them. Hayes had seen many a young ranger comrade fall victim to poor decision-making in this instance, only to miss their single shot and be cruelly ended by the Comanche. Hence, even as his pursuers rained down arrows upon his claustrophobic position, Hayes forced himself to hold his fire. Any time a warrior would attempt to make a terminal charge on his position, Hayes would brandish the rifle barrel at him, managing each time to dissuade his attackers. Hayes knew that, 
for all their tactical prowess and combative ferocity, the Comanche approach to warfare did not now nor ever entail the enduring of casualties en masse in order to obtain a victory of any kind. In the mind of the Plains warrior, it was always better, if possible, to fight to another day. Such prudence, though no doubt understandable, left an exploitable gap for those caught in the ire of their attack. Even though alone and with a single-shot weapon, survival for the experienced ranger was not wholly impossible, and so Hayes hunkered down and fought on. The Comanche, though, soon tired of this hated intruder keeping them at bay from atop their own sacred landmark, and so, again in the words of J.W. Wilbarger, they resolved to make their attack in earnest. Hayes steadied himself behind the makeshift rock wall he had hastily constructed and waited what must have been an agonizing few minutes as the Comanche surrounded the base of the rock and began a charge en masse toward his position. Hayes waited unmoved, still hunkered down, until the leading warrior was within a few yards of his position. At the last second, Hayes rose up, brought the warrior into the sights of his rifle, and squeezed the trigger, sending a lead ball into the Comanche's torso. This caused the Comanche to momentarily stop to assess the damage to their fallen comrade and to shield themselves from any more gunfire that may be coming. When it was discovered the lead warrior was dead, the cry was put out in long wolf-like howls to move back to the base of the rock. This the Comanche did, as Hayes used the brief respite to reload and refit his rifle. He also rechecked the pair of Colt Patterson revolvers he had holstered on either hip, ensuring himself at least ten additional shots once his initial, and this time likely final, rifle shot had been fired. In short order, the Comanche contingent made another, even more vociferous attack upon Hayes' position. The Comanche war cries flooded the air with high-pitched, blood-curdling screeches that would have shaken almost any Texan to their core, but not Jack Hayes. Hayes again coolly received the charge until the Comanches were within range, once again popping up from his position to the last second. Only this time, sensing this to be his proverbial last hurrah, Hayes pulled his revolvers and emptied the entirety of one's five-shot cylinder into the Comanche surrounding him. This, again, begat another Comanche retreat. As Hayes again hunkered down and began hurriedly reloading for what he assumed was an inevitable third Comanche assault, he heard what must have been the very welcome sound of his comrades firing their weapons and making their way towards Enchanted Rock. They had been fighting an even larger body of Comanche during Hayes' tete-a-tete with the Comanche and had only discovered his position when they heard the shots of his rifle and revolvers coming from high up on Enchanted Rock. Seeing this much larger force of Texians advancing, the Comanche force surrounding Enchanted Rock took their wounded and withdrew into the canyons and sagebrush of the hill country, leaving their dead for the vultures and Texans. Hayes and his cohorts reunited at the base of the rock and, under an undoubtedly more vigilant watch, continued their work until the next day. Hayes would go on to carry out countless more adventures, from leading the rangers in the Mexican-American War to chasing down Comanche raiders. His legend among the Comanche would grow to such an extent that they bestowed upon him the begrudgingly respectful nicknames of Captain Jack, pronounced Captain Yak, and Bravo Too Much or Brave Too Much. In a culture like the Comanche, where courage and martial prowess were the ultimate in masculine virtues, even an avowed enemy like Jack Hayes was due his wages in reverence. Hayes would go on to marry Susan Calvert, daughter of a wealthy local hotel owner in Seguin, Texas in 1847. In 1849, the young couple moved to California, along with millions of other Americans, in hopes of capitalizing on the new state's gold rush. Though he did not strike it rich in gold, Hayes would go on to become a successful rancher and businessman, and was elected sheriff of San Francisco in 1850. In 1853, not long after Hayes' first son, John Caperton Hayes, had been born in California, a peculiar package arrived in the mail for the new father. Inside the parcel was a small golden spoon, sent as a gift by the legendary Comanche chief, 
Buffalo Hump. The spoon came with a small engraving on the handle that read, Buffalo Hump Jr. Such was the level of respect Hayes had earned even amongst his longtime enemy. Hayes would pass away in 1883 at the age of 66 and is buried at the Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland, California. Tonight's story was but one snippet of Hayes' life, one that is replete with accounts of Comanche battles, suicidal attacks during the Mexican-American War, and countless other legendary escapades. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Texas, March 19th, 1840. Amidst the rolling limestone hills, oak-strewn pastures, and vibrant Texas wildflowers, a contingent of Comanche men, women, and children made their way to the town of San Antonio, under the guidance of their band's most revered war chief, Muguara, or Spirit Talker. They had come bearing items for trade and were looking forward to a revelrous and hopefully profitable day. They had come, they assumed, to trade for needed wares and to barter their goods. This was not unheard of, nor even altogether uncommon on the Texas frontier. The warfare and bloodshed that was underway in the war for Texas was a far more fluid affair than is often portrayed today, and trading between yesterday's enemy and tomorrow's foe was often as much a matter of convenience as it was necessity. In fact, Spirit Talker himself had strode the line between collegiality and combativeness between cultures far more frequently and more adeptly than most. In the years prior, he had provided not only shelter to Texas Rangers, his presumed mortal enemy, but had defended them from attack by the neighboring Wacos. On this day, the problem was, as far as the residents of San Antonio were concerned, that the Comanche's wares included not just goods, but a person a daughter of a San Antonio resident. She and her sister had been kidnapped from their family farm on the Texas frontier two years earlier. Her name was Matilda Lockhart. She was 16 years old in 1840, and the last two years of her life had been a living nightmare that had seen her kidnapped, sold into slavery, sexual and otherwise, subjected to abuses, sexual and otherwise, humiliation, subjugation, and even mutilation. Not only had she been repeatedly raped and forced to labor under pain of violence, her nose had been burned to her face. The cartilage on her nose had been burned off to the bone on her face. Famed Texas frontier woman Mary Maverick cared for Lockhart upon her arrival in San Antonio and described her experience. She described Miss Lockhart's condition as, quote, utterly degraded and could not hold her head up again. Her head, arms, and face were full of bruises and sores, and her nose actually burnt off to the bone, all the fleshy end gone, and a great scab formed on the end of the bone. Both nostrils were wide open and denuded of flesh. She told a piteous tale how dreadfully the Indians had beaten her and how they would wake her from her sleep by sticking a chunk of fire to her flesh, especially to her nose. Her body had many scars from the fire." End quote. There is some dispute among historians as to the entirety of the veracity of Mary Maverick's account as several preceding accounts of Comanche visitors who had encountered Matilda and a contingent of other white and Mexican women and children who had been kidnapped and made captives and slaves of the band failed to mention such outward and obvious signs of physical torture. However, as conflicting as the accounts may be on this matter, it is safe to say Matilda Lockhart's appearance sparked an outrage in the residents of San Antonio for two reasons. One that she had suffered enough physical abuse for it to be easily visually discernible by all present, and two, that she was the only captive present. Earlier in the year, 
General Sidney Albert Johnson had ordered. The problem with this approach, aside from its blank check for bloodshed should its acceptable terms not be reached, was that it presumed that the Comanche had a centralized power structure of chiefs. This was not the case with the Comanche. They were not under one chief. They did not even cede full political power to band headmen outside of the times of war. And even then, the warrior with the most power was the one able to raise the most warriors for his proposed raid or battle against the enemy du jour. The Comanche had no centralized power, and thus could not be negotiated with as a singular entity. This was not only unknown to most whites at the time, it was all but incomprehensible to them. And, even if they did understand it, it made negotiating the return of hostages from the Comanche a daunting, if not impossible, task. Now, on this warm spring day, as the contingent of Comanche composed of unarmed men, women, and children made their way through the mud-laden and refuse-strewn streets of San Antonio, they stopped to pick up pieces of scrap iron to use for arrows and spears. This further confounded the Texans present and added to the overall surreality and awkwardness of the situation. Some residents tried to make nice with the visitors, setting up small targets for the children to shoot with their toy bows and arrows. But as the word spread that there was only one white woman captive present and that she was terribly disfigured, the collective ire of San Antonio focused on the Comanche that stood in front of them. The commanding military officer present, Colonel William Fisher, summoned the twelve chiefs present to what was known as the Council House, a one-story 18th century stone building in the plaza of the city. In fact, you can still go to this place where this, where this all happened. You can still go there today. It's on the east side of the main plaza in San Antonio behind the Drury Inn. The original building is gone, but there is still a two-story structure where the council house stood. The Comanche chiefs came inside, still assuming that this would be an amiable affair, and took seats on the floor along the wall. The contingent of Texans present, including military and Texas Rangers, stood lining the other three walls, assuming what seemed to be strangely ominous positions to the chiefs present. When all were assembled, Colonel Fisher spoke curtly through a translator to Spirit Talker, who served as a spokesman for his group. The colonel demanded to know where the other captives were and why the chief had not seen fit to honor his prior commitment of returning the white captives under his charge. Spirit Talker, still assuming this entire situation was one big misunderstanding, his tone seemed to vacillate between peaceable and haughty as he took greater and greater offense to the colonel's accusations. But he made no overtly offensive comments or movements, only concluding his explanation with the question, how do you like that answer? However sought after Spirit Talker had been in his life until this point as a great speaker and negotiator and a downright likable guy, he fatally misread his audience on this occasion. Colonel Fisher became enraged and stated that he did not like Spirit Talker's answer one bit, and that now Spirit Talker and his cohort of chiefs were under arrest until all of the Texas hostages were returned. Some soldiers moved to block the door, as others moved toward the Comanche chiefs intending to subdue and handcuff them before transporting them to the San Antonio jail. In these fleeting moments, as the gravity of the situation settled in on Spirit Talker and his cohort of war chiefs, there seemed to be an air of confusion and disbelief. Then, in a flash, the violence started. Spirit Talker pulled a knife he had concealed on his person and stabbed one of the soldiers in the chest as he made a break for the door. The other chiefs all either pulled concealed weapons of their own or attempted to grab the rifles of the soldiers, hoping to either make a break for their lives or sell their lives as dearly as possible. Inside the small room, gunfire erupted, with eardrum rattling volume and intensity. As smoke filled the room, bodies began to thud to the ground, some dead, some dying, some injured, and some still fighting. Ranger Matthew Caldwell, known as 
old paint because of his terribly sun-mottled skin, took a round to the shin, hit the ground in agony, while still pulling his sidearm and beginning to systematically shoot down any Comanche that he could. The fight spilled quickly outside the doors, as the fleeing chiefs who emerged alive alerted their tribesmen of what was coming. What transpired was an hours-long, city-wide carnival of carnage. The children, who had been shooting at targets with their toy bows and arrows, turned them on live targets, drilling a number of residents with very real arrows, and even killing a district judge by drilling him in the heart with several arrows. He fell dead in the street as the Comanche desperately attempted to fight their way out of San Antonio. The residents, soldiers, and rangers present were now on a house-by-house kill-or-capture mission to bring in as many Comanche as they could and kill any who would not surrender or did not surrender to the Texans' standards. Two warriors attempted to take refuge in a local home, barricading themselves inside. The Texians set fire to the roof, smoking the Comanches out of the house. As soon as they escaped the door, one was shot down and the other had his head split open with an axe. All the Comanche who were not killed outright were shuffled into the open-roofed jailhouse and placed under arrest. They were told they would be detained until all Texan captives had been returned to San Antonio. One Comanche was given a horse and told to ride back to the camp they had come from to inform the rest of their tribesmen of what had happened, what the new terms were, and that the Texans meant business. The rider made haste northward over the limestone cliffs and oak meadows back to the home camp of his band. Upon learning what happened to their friends and relatives, the camp itself erupted into its own torrent of grief, anger, despair, and hate. The wives of the slain chiefs and warriors mutilated themselves, cutting off their hair, slashing their breasts, and cutting off their fingertips. One inflicted such severe wounds on herself that she died of severe blood loss. Then, one by one, starting with Matilda Lockhart's own six-year-old sister, all the captives who had not been adopted into the tribe were dragged from their tents, stripped naked, and roasted alive over hot Comanche campfires on the dry, sun-soaked Texas plains. They were mocked and taunted as they begged for their lives, not understanding in their last moments that they were the penance for the deeds of their would-be rescuers. After this hours-long ordeal, each and every horse belonging to the dead chiefs and warriors was slaughtered by bashing in its head, shooting it with arrows, or slitting its throat. Thousands of dead horses as the Comanche had exponentially more than any tribe, soon covered the now blood-soaked plains. For both the Texans and the Comanche, there would be no conciliatory terms offered. Now, this was a war to the end. But this story is just getting started. What the Comanche did next would be warfare the likes of which no tribe had ever seen or been able to accomplish and either scale or ferocity. They were about to take this war all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, and they planned to either kill every Texan they could or drive them into the ocean. But that is a story for another day. August 12th, 1840, near present-day Lockhart, Texas. In the humid, burning dawn so common to Central Texas summers, 24-year-old Nancy Darst Crosby sat dejectedly on the back of an unshod, rough-haired pony. Though her skin was terribly sunburnt and her thighs horribly chafed from days of riding, she said nothing, for it would do no good. All she could do was run the events of the previous few days through her head. She and a number of other captives, mostly women, had been taken during a series of brutal Comanche raids along the South Texas coast. They had watched their loved ones cut down, their homes burned to the ground, and entire populations of their hometowns scattered into the shallow Texas bays to seek refuge from the attack 
in wooden merchant ships anchored offshore. They had come all the way to Texas relatively recently, most of them from frontier states like Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Nancy herself was the granddaughter of legendary frontiersman Daniel Boone. She had settled in South Texas, married, and given birth to a son only a little over a year earlier. A blissful family life seemed all but assured until the Comanche came on that one dreadful day. They had killed her husband and taken her and her baby son captive. The customary Comanche treatment of women's prisoners would be termed inhumane by any measure, with sexual assault being an assumed norm and the outright killing of captives being a matter wholly left to the whims of their captors. Nancy's whalebone corset had prevented the sexual assault, but her baby had been summarily stabbed to death in front of her when she could not quiet the child's screams. One can only imagine what she felt, only days later, as she faced yet another day of ceaseless torment. This party of Comanche, though typical in their tactics, was highly unusual both in the size and scope of the raiding they had committed. They also presented a strikingly unusual visual. Many wore the traditional breechcloths and leggings, with headdresses made of buffalo horns, feathers, wolf's heads, and one even wearing the skin of a sand crane atop his head. They were armed with bows, arrows, 14-foot lances, shields, and a number of pistols and rifles they had procured in trading and raiding. But perhaps the most striking sight in the roving, raiding band was the adornment of its warriors in some of the newest, trendiest fashions of the time. Top hats, new leather boots, blankets, lace, umbrellas, and brass button coats worn backwards. To top off this bizarre scene, war horses, lances, and shields were all festooned with links of bright red ribbons. The sheer size of this force was also a highly unusual factor that day. Comanche raiding parties usually struck swiftly and scattered immediately after a raid, but this party included the wives and children of the warriors, for this was no ordinary raid. It had started when the Comanche chief Buffalo Hump had awakened one night having seen a vision in his dreams. Only weeks earlier, the Comanche had suffered the loss of many of their greatest war chiefs in what came to be known as the Council House Fight. The Comanche had brought in a young captive white girl named Matilda Lockhart in order to trade her surrender for goods and an agreement to the cessation of any more white trespassing. But the horrendously pitiable condition of the young girl caused such an uproar in the city of San Antonio that an arrest was attempted. When that was resisted, the chiefs were shot down. It had been a seminal event in recent Comanche history, and Buffalo Hump and his band of Panateca Comanche had burned for revenge ever since. But it wasn't until Buffalo Hump reported his vision to his people that a plan for revenge began to materialize. In his dream, he had seen the Panateca and their allies, the Kiowas, driving the white intruders into the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Those that they were not able to kill outright were expelled from Texas forever. The victory would be glorious, the spoils innumerable, and the redemption for the Comanche total. And up until this point, Buffalo Hump had proven all but prophetic. The Comanche raiding party had cut a torrent of violence south from the Texas hill country to the coast, and now they were on their return trip. But now, three factors were working against them as they made their way back northwest, back to the limestone and cedar of the hill country. First, the bounty they had fought so brutally to ascertain now became a burden. The weight of the iron cookware, cloth, clothing, firearms, ammunition, food, and other sundries, not to mention their terribly traumatized and physically compromised captives, slowed the party's advancement considerably. Secondly, the Comanche had not only broken their typical practice of scattering after a raid, but were following the same trail to get back home that they had used to make their attacks in the first place. This made them easy for trackers to follow, which was not often the case after native raids. This led us to our third and final problem faced by Buffalo Hump and his sizable contingent. They were now being tracked by the Texas Rangers as well as a number of local militiamen. 
This made a rapid egress all the more important, yet simultaneously difficult to accomplish. The Rangers, a relatively recently formed force, had thus far presented some of the only consequential resistance to the Comanches in the whole of Texas. They were largely young, violence-hungry men who had come to Texas for the express purpose of tracking, trailing, and killing Comanches. According to several contemporary accounts, at this time, their mortality rate was around 50%. These young men were becoming a sizable thorn in the side of the Comanche, but were simultaneously experiencing a sort of Darwinism via combat in which the weaker and or more unfortunate among them became weeded out via hard, often torturous deaths at the hands of the Comanche. Nonetheless, these bellicose young men armed with revolvers and bowie knives and clad in serapes and buckskin represented the only hope that Nancy Darst Crosby and her fellow captives had left. If they were not rescued before reaching the undulating topography of the hill country, they would be taken onto the prairie and very likely never seen again. Neither the captives nor the captors were aware of just how close the rangers and their cohorts were though. While the raiding party made its languid march northwestward, the rangers were making every move within their power to garner additional forces as well as track the Comanche. The ranger ranks included men whose names would become legendary in the annals of Texas history. Bigfoot Wallace, Ben and Henry McCulloch, Matthew Old Paint Caldwell, Ed Burleson, John Tomlinson, and Jack Hayes. Several of the rangers had been tracking the Comanche with the help of their Tonkawa scouts under their chief, Placido. The Tonkawa are a tribe native to central Texas who had been devastated for generations by Comanche raiding and expansion. All too often unheralded in conventional narratives of the West, native scouts were essentially the only trackers skilled enough to actually find villages that forces like the rangers and the U.S. Army sought to engage. Their willingness to assist in hunting down and often killing their fellow native peoples speaks to just how deep the divisions could run between tribes. At the same time, local militia forces from around the area were being marshaled under the leadership of the relatively inexperienced Felix Huston. They received word that they were to rendezvous with the rangers at a designated spot on a small tributary of the San Marcos River, about 40 miles north-northeast of San Antonio. Huston and his volunteers arrived at this spot on what is today known as Plum Creek, dismounted, and waited for the Comanche. They had placed themselves directly in line with the Comanche's path, and it would be only a short time until the lumbering Comanche party came into view. But for all their bloodlust and anger, the relative neophytes to combat on the Texas frontier hesitated. The Comanche party, although composed in large part of women, children, and elderly members, was still far larger than the Texans. Though they had the advantage in position and firepower, plus the element of surprise, Huston was unwilling to make an outright attack on the party until the more experienced rangers arrived. The rangers, for their part, were all making their way as fast as possible to the scene, but as some were coming from a variety of locations due to having been out on patrol, the arrival of their full force had been momentarily delayed. Huston was, undoubtedly, in a difficult position. Should he make a cavalier charge, one he was ill-equipped to lead, he might lose many of his own men. Thus, Huston and his volunteers took up a defensive position, hunkering down and preparing to receive the Comanche charge that would inevitably come when they were spotted. Huston's men dismounted, a nearly always mortal mistake in warfare against mounted tribes, and began to pepper the large Comanche party with shots, as well as make half-hearted advances, only to be driven back by Comanche attacks. The Comanche warriors, perhaps the world's best horsemen at the time, began to ride back and forth in front of their people, red streamers whipping in the wind and new top hats flying off their heads. They rode suicidally close to the Texan lines, with some indeed losing their lives to Texan bullets. For the Comanche though, as has been noted by several military tacticians, these were not offensive attacks meant to unseat the Texans from their ground, nor even necessarily kill them all. The Comanche intention, with their great visual display and seemingly complete disregard for their own personal well-being, 
was to create a distraction that would be so all-encompassing for their enemy that the retreat of their wives and children would go unnoticed. For roughly half an hour, these exchanges continued. As the rangers began to arrive and assess the situation, though, they became more and more impatient with Huston's refusal to take offensive action. Just then, a Comanche chief with a resplendent white shield and feather headdress led a charge to within yards of the Texas position. But the Texan bullocks managed to cut him down on his retreat back to his line. And at this point, everything changed. The Comanche, who often believed a warrior's medicine or puha would make him invulnerable to bullets, were so shaken by this that an all-out retreat began. And at this point, the ranger's patience with Huston had been exhausted. Ben McCulloch, a legendary ranger captain, exhorted the volunteer commander that, Now's the time, Captain. Charge him. They are whipped. Every second they hesitated meant more distance between themselves and the Comanche, and more importantly, the Comanche's captives. The Texans mounted and the rangers led the way as a running fight would ensue over roughly 15 miles of rolling prairie and cactus-strewn hills. The Comanche continued westward toward the hillier country around the Colorado River west of Austin. For hours, arrows flew, screams and gunshots resounded, and the air was thick with the acrid smell of gunpowder and the iron-tinged aroma of blood. Bodies of men, women, and children littered the ground. The wounded were shot dead without exception. One Comanche woman's head was stomped into an unrecognizable mass of bone and tissue. Eventually, the volunteers, rangers, and Tonkawa scouts would regroup to assess their losses and to discuss the next course of action. They had inflicted at least 80 dead upon the Comanche and sent them fleeing for their lives into the hill country. By mathematical standards, the Battle of Plum Creek, as it would come to be known, was a resounding victory for the Texans. However, they had only recovered a fraction of the 3,000 head of horses that had been stolen, as well as a fraction of the goods that had been apprehended. And though they had certainly hastened the retreat of their adversaries, the Texans as a whole had failed in achieving their primary objective, the recapturing of the hostages that had been taken by the Comanche. And when the scouting parties were sent out, they came upon the horrific consequences of their failure. Nancy Crosby was found not long before sundown. She had been tied to a tree, presumably crying out and fighting. As the battle whirled nearby, the gunshots and battle cries likely drowned out her desperate pleas to be spared. But she was not spared. Nancy Crosby was mercilessly drilled with several Comanche arrows through her torso. Her death had likely been quick, but certainly not painless. In the last week of Nancy Crosby's life, she had been kidnapped, assaulted, watched her husband and then her baby killed in front of her, and been subjected to endless torment and torture at the hands of her captors. Her only fleeting hope had seemed all too close, and then her life was ruthlessly snuffed out when her rescue was presumably only minutes away. One could be forgiven for thinking that such horrors were the exception, but Nancy Crosby's story was all too common on the bleeding frontier of Texas. This was not the land of dime novels or tall tales. This was an unforgiving place that was seemingly inextricably ensconced in a cycle of violence, grief, and revenge. But, as S.C. Gwynn points out in Empire of the Summer Moon, the deaths of Nancy Crosby and her fellow captives were not the result of random violence. Their lives were seen as currency, as just retribution for the mini Panateca Comanche who had been cut down in the streets and courthouse of San Antonio. Those Comanche were killed in retribution for the treatment of the young Matilda Lockhart. Matilda Lockhart had been kidnapped and treated as a subhuman because she was of a people who were trespassing on, killing, and attempting to end the way of life of the Comanche just as the Comanche had done to the Apache before them. And so the story of the Old West goes, an endless succession of transgression and retribution. Many of the rangers there that day would go on to legendary careers and fight in some of the most significant battles in the history of Texas. Huston, 
would be forever hampered in his political ambitions by the prevailing, and not wholly inaccurate, perception that he had cost at least some of the captives their lives due to his unwillingness to pursue more offensive tactics. The Battle of Plum Creek would be the only the beginning in the Texas conflict with the Comanche. However, it would mark the last time the Comanche would attempt raiding of such a massive scale and scope. The bloodshed in Texas would not only carry on for decades to come, it would only intensify. The tales of raiding, rescue, and revenge in the Old West are innumerable, and rest assured we here at HOKC will do our best to cover all of them. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. October 13th, 1837, Fort Smith, Texas, north of present-day Waco. In the crisp autumn air, the acrid aroma of burnt coffee beans hung like a morning fog, mixing with the pungent, ever-present smell of livestock, manure, and campfire smoke. As the regulars of the fort began their day's work of chores and guard duty, a group of a few dozen grizzled, buckskin-clad men saddled their horses, checked their single-shot rifles and pistols, and made ready to venture outside the relative safety of the fort walls. Leading this contingent of men was Lieutenant A.B. Van Van Thusen and Captain William Eastland. Before heading out, they conferred over the planned course of their incursion into what, at the time, was likely the most dangerous territory on the North American continent. Both men were relative newcomers to their positions in leadership, and though both felt they had been sufficiently respected in their tenures thus far, their positions as commissioned officers granted them little to none of the deference and obedience that would be expected within the ranks of the conventional military. That was because this was not the conventional military. These were the Texas Rangers. They themselves were a newly founded hybrid force of military and law enforcement that had been stood up by the burgeoning Republic of Texas after its cessation from Mexico, though a number of tribes were or would eventually be on cooperative terms with the Spanish, French, Mexicans, and now Texians, tribes like the Waco, the Karankawa, the Apache, and the Caddo would routinely raid homesteads up and down the river valleys and flatland prairies of central and southern Texas. But of the sites any settler on the Texas frontier could see, perhaps the most terrifying was that of the Comanche. The Comanche were relatively recent arrivals to Texas themselves, having made their way down from the Rockies of Wyoming as part of a perpetually impoverished Shoshone offshoot. However, with the advent of horses from the Spanish making their way north, the trajectory of Comanche history had been forever altered. The Comanche were soon known as the most innately gifted horsemen of any tribe in North America. Their newly found attributes of speed and mobility made the Comanche not just a formidable force to any who drew their ire, but a killing and raiding machine the likes of which had rarely, if ever, been seen on the entirety of the continent before. The raids that were being conducted and would be conducted for decades to come were so all-encompassing in their violence and ferocity that they would effectively stall any sizable settlement attempts west of Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio until well into the 19th century. On this day in 1837, the rangers made their way out of the gates of Fort Smith and headed out into the wilds of the Texas Hill Country in search of a raiding party of Comanche who had stolen a large number of horses from settlements on the Colorado River. The Comanche had headed north towards the open prairies and the rangers hoped to catch them before they absconded into the vast, empty expanses of the Great Plains. Over the succeeding weeks, the ranger force made their way up the Colorado River, trailing the Comanche party. On November 1st, the two officers, Van Bentuzen and Eastland, split their forces in order to follow different trails. This reduced Van Bentuzen's force to 18 men. They continued north until reaching the Brazos, where they got into a brief skirmish with a party of Cherokee and Kichi, whom they had mistaken for Comanches. One Kichi was actually killed before the Cherokee were able to make discernible peace signs towards the Texians. This caused no small amount of embarrassment and conciliatory efforts on behalf of the Rangers. 
The Cherokee and Kichi were also avowed enemies of the Comanche, having lost far more of their wives, children, and warriors to Comanche raiding than even the most remote and harrowed frontier settlers in Texas. Once amends had been made, the Cherokee and Kichi was still gracious enough and pragmatic enough to point the rangers in the direction of the fleeing Comanche party. Despite the loss of one of their own party, their hatred for Comanche raiders would outweigh their disdain for Texian intruders on this particular occasion. It would be another full week of tracking, though, until November 10th at a location Lieutenant Van Bentusen marked at latitude 33 and a half north on the Trinity River that rangers would finally make contact with their intended target. The two parties spotted each other almost simultaneously, as the Comanche were unaccustomed to being followed so far into their own territory that they had ceased posting the sentries that would have been de rigueur were they closer to the Texian settlements. The Comanche immediately split their forces, with some of the younger warriors driving the horse herd off to the north and the more experienced warriors heading off to attack Van Bentusen's rangers, utilizing tactics that would soon be considered nearly suicidal with the advent of more combat experience against Comanche forces. The rangers dismounted and prepared to receive the Comanche charge from behind a mound that rose up from the surrounding prairies and woodlands. Lieutenant Van Bentusen stood on top of the mound to survey the oncoming force and estimated it to be roughly 150 mounted Comanche warriors. Riders whose skill might be best exemplified for the modern day listener in a rodeo trick rider. All capable of unleashing 10 or more arrows a minute and all coming at them at full speed. This meant that the Texian force of 18 men was outnumbered roughly 8 to 1. These were not terribly favorable odds and Van Ventusen and his men were all too aware of this. The rangers moved back from the ridge, deciding instead to receive the Comanche charge from the cover of a small thicket of trees at the base of a ridge. Almost immediately after making it to the timber line, the Comanche were upon them, raining arrows down upon the ranger position and, as Van Ventusen describes, uttering the most savage yells. The rangers, armed with single-shot rifles and pistols, could not match the volume of fire nor maneuverability that the Comanche were now so deftly wielding against them. For over two hours, the fight raged on with intermittent attacks nearly overrunning the Texians several times. Though these men had not been long in Texas, they all understood that being overrun by the Comanches would mean for each and every one of them a terrible death. The rules of plains warfare, especially in Texas, made no concessions for prisoners when it came to military-aged males. Should they be overrun here, any who were not killed outright would be slowly, sadistically, tortured to death underneath the looming Texas sky. Even in 1837, every hamlet, homestead, and burgeoning city had been inundated with the tales of Comanche victims being burned skinned, eviscerated, and emasculated, in the literal sense, all while still alive and begging for mercy. But, as was now apparent to every man hunkered down amongst the trees that day, there was no mercy to be found in Texas. Van Bentusen describes the fighting as mostly taking place within 15 to 20 feet of each other, with bullets and arrows flying the exhortations of commanders and the screams of the wounded filling the air. Four rangers and six horses were killed in the initial fighting, as the Comanche exacted a heavy toll on the small force. The lieutenant described the Comanche as being led on by a chief who was most splendidly mounted. Again and again throughout the afternoon hours, the rangers had tried and failed to bring this chief down. Finally, a Texian bullet managed to find its target, and the chief tumbled from his mount, dead. In Comanche warfare, this was not just a tactical loss, but a spiritual condemnation as well. They believed the chief's medicine, or puha, had been somehow compromised, indicative that the metaphysical powers that they relied upon were no longer working in their favor. The Comanche warriors retreated over a ridge and out of sight, 
leaving the rangers under the impression that the battle was over. But it was not. After about 15 minutes, another Comanche charred barreled over the ridge at full speed. The rangers, who had been tending to their wounded and making ready to retreat, again took up defensive positions within the cluster of trees. A new chief was leading the Comanches this time, and the attack, as before, came head on at the rangers as they hunkered down and did their best to return fire. Then, one of the Texans noticed an even thicker layer of smoke than was typical of a battle like this, rapidly ensconcing their force. Looking around, the source of the smoke was discovered. The Comanche had lit a giant ring of fire around the wooded area, intent on either smoking out the rangers or watching them burn alive. Left with these two options, Van Ventusen ordered his men into a headlong attack on foot. The rangers charged out of the tree line, kneeling to fire and then reloading on the move as arrows flew all around them and the fire raged larger and loomed even closer. This charge, all but suicidal in its execution, lasted roughly ten minutes and left six more rangers dead. This offensive attack did, however, drive the Comanche, whose tactical repertoire did not include receiving attacks at any great cost to themselves, into a retreat. This left a brief but sufficient gap in time in which the rangers managed to collect their wounded and make their escape, on foot, to the Sabine River. A full 58 days after they had ridden out of Fort Smith, Lieutenant Van Bentusen's ranger force, now just eight men strong, straggled their way back into Fort Smith. They had been lucky to survive, and they all knew it. It would be several years, and many lives lost later, until the rangers would learn how to fight effectively against mounted Comanches in open territory. Until then, fights like this would happen countless times, with many leaving no survivors to tell the tale. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. South Texas, 1840. A group of Texas Rangers are in hot pursuit of a raiding party of Comanches. The Comanche have been running rampant over the territory for years, killing, kidnapping, and stealing from both Mexican settlers and Anglo-Texans alike. However, this particular Comanche raiding party has aggrieved these rangers more personally than the rest. These young Texans have received a wound to their pride. The evening prior, they had neared a small farming village known as the Zumwalt Settlement. After a hard day's patrol in the territory in search of any Comanche raiding parties, they had decided that, being in such close proximity to the settlement, they would be in no danger of encountering any Comanche. The young rangers had made camp, eaten heartily, and settled down for a restful night, expecting to rise bright and early and make their way into the settlement. They were, in fact, so sure of their immunity from the Comanche that they had not bothered to stake down their horses, a practice seen as standard operating procedure when operating on the frontier. This presumption had cost them dearly. When they woke to find their horses gone and themselves stranded, still miles from town. They had walked into the Zumwalt settlement with their saddles slung over their shoulders, sheepish, indignant, and set on revenge. They had managed to procure fresh mounts from a local rancher and had spent the remainder of the day tracking the Comanche who were now in possession of their horses. These rangers, though a group of about a dozen, are representative of the rangers as a whole. They are all young, and hungry for combat. However, at this point in 1840, very few of them have much, if any, relevant combat experience against the Comanche. This is no small factor, and one that weighs heavily on the minds of the young Texans. The reality of what fighting the Comanche will entail has become all too stark with the advent of the raiding party making off with their horses. If they were able to get close enough to steal their horses, the young men fairly reasoned, they would have been close enough to have been able to kill all of the rangers outright. Even in 1840, in the early stages of Texans and Americans beginning their efforts to wrest Texas from the Comanche, 
The tales of the horrific fates that have befallen those who met their ends at the hands of the Comanche are well known to nearly everyone in the territory. The Comanche have, in the last century and a half, conquered vast swaths of Texas by a hard, brutal warfare. For centuries prior, the Comanche had existed as an offshoot of the Shoshone tribe, eking out a living as hunter-gatherers in the northern Rockies. They had long been the perpetual whipping boy for the tribes that surrounded them, but everything had changed for the Comanche when, at some point during the 17th century, they had first encountered the horse. Initially brought to the New World by the Spanish, horses had at first been a tightly guarded commodity. Their utility for use in transportation and warfare were obvious to even the most cursory observer, and thus the methods used in breeding, training, and caring for the animals were viewed as a technology that the natives must never be privy to. However, the Spanish idea of keeping horses to themselves had quite literally gone up in smoke with the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. The Pueblo Revolt, also known as Pope's Rebellion, had seen the much aggrieved Puebloan people rise up against the Spanish officials as well as the Catholic authorities in the area. The governor was beheaded. Over 400 Spanish citizens were killed. Churches were burned to the ground, and thousands of horses, those not taken by the Pueblos themselves, escaped onto the vast expanses of the northern New Mexico plains. Though many tribes, such as the Apache, Navajo, and Utes, had made contact with and adopted the horse into their culture as both a means of transportation and a food source, it was the Comanche who had fostered a truly paradigm-shifting relationship with the animal. They quickly mastered riding, hunting, warfare, and even selective breeding. And with the advent of their new technology and lifestyle, the Comanche had ascended from an incessantly downtrodden tribe to a highly mobile and highly motivated war machine. Their lives centered around the vast herds of buffalo, whom they drew nearly all of their resources from. The fight for the buffalo's most plentiful roaming grounds in the southern plains which comprised the area from present-day Kansas to Texas had been a ruthless affair. Texas had initially belonged to the Apache, but over decades of brutal raiding and seemingly systematic elimination, the Comanche had overtaken the vast majority of the most bountiful hunting grounds. By the 1840s, virtually the entirety of the southern plains was under Comanche control. The Comanche had no patience for intruders on their hard-won new lands, and viewed the Texans as an especially irascible lot. The Texans, just as the Spanish and Mexicans before them, seek to take what the Comanches believe to be rightfully theirs. In retaliation for their transgressions in venturing into their lands and reaping its many bounties, the Comanche have killed countless settlers, men, women, and children, via unmentionably torturous methods. These stories have spread like wildfire through Texas settlements, causing equal parts terror and outrage. This group of young rangers have all heard the stories, many times over. For many, the promise of avenging these atrocities had been a driving factor in making their decision to venture out here onto the bleeding edge of the frontier in the first place. However, now, the prospect of becoming the subject of one of these unfortunate recollections begins to eat away at their psyches. They are led by the 23-year-old William Alexander Anderson Wallace. Wallace, known as Bigfoot Wallace, would go on to become a legendary and notorious ranger who is recognized today as a seminal figure in Texas history. However, on this day, he is an unsure rookie whose short tenure as commander has already been marred by the shame of allowing the Comanche to get away with their mounts. Wallace is intent on finding and engaging the Comanche, but unsure on exactly how to accomplish either of these goals. Luckily for Wallace and for the rest of these young men, they have been joined by an unexpected visitor earlier in the day. While they themselves adhere to no formalized grooming or dress standards, often wearing anything that pleased them from buckskin leggings to cotton shirts to sombreros, this addition to their party stands out to even the most cursory of observers. He is several years older than the rest of the group in his late thirties, and he is clad in a buckskin shirt and leggings 
that looked to have not been taken off nor washed since the day he first put them on. The man wears a coonskin cap that looks no more maintained than the rest of his attire and carries a relatively antiquated Kentucky rifle and single-shot pistol. He sits astride a large, skittish, raw-boned horse he calls Pepper Pod. The horse seems ill at ease with saddle and bridle, though unwavering in his obedience to his master. In the man's belt are tucked a scalpel-sharp tomahawk and a knife, whose handle is stained with rust-like sprinklings of dried blood. But perhaps the most striking and unsettling feature of the man now riding with this small group of young rangers are his eyes. Bigfoot Wallace, in his biography, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, linked to purchase in the description, gives the following account. I have seen eyes of all sorts, of panthers, wolves, catamounts, leopards, and Mexican lions, but I never saw eyes that glittered and flashed and danced about like those in that man's head. Only this morning, this group of young men and this mysterious stranger had not known each other at all. The rangers had, in fact, been alarmed when the man had first approached, as his appearance and demeanor were not readily identifiable as friendly. But the man, who had introduced himself as Jeff Turner, has thus far proven invaluable. He had recounted for Wallace the tragic murder of his wife and three sons at the hands of the Comanche, and offered to assist the rangers in their quest for vengeance. His sole purpose in life, he insists, is now to track down and kill all the Comanche he can until he is killed himself. He now lives alone in a small camp on a creek north of Victoria, Texas. On the walls of his tent hang 42 Comanche scalps. Turner says he hopes to bring that total to 100 someday. Sensing the young ranger's inexperience in trailing and engaging the formidable lords of the southern plains, Turner insists that he has just the rare set of skills and experience that the rangers are in need of. Again quoting from The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, Turner told the rangers that, I know every water and hole between here and the Rio Grande, and I will go any way these Indians go. I will travel on the freshest Indian trail I come across. You and your company may get tired and quit this trail without overtaking the Indians, but I shall stick to it until I get a scalp or two to take back with me to my camp. The rangers have continued on trailing the Comanche under Turner's guidance since late in the morning, and as the Texas sun bore down upon them, they rode in silence, eyes locked down towards the ground, searching for signs of the raiding party. Again, quoting from Bigfoot Wallace's account, We soon discovered that he knew more about following a trail than all of us put together, and from this time on, we let him take the lead, and followed him wherever he went. Sometimes, where the ground was very hard and rocky, and the Indians had scattered, he would hesitate for a while as to the course to pursue. But in a moment or so he was all right again, and off at such a rate that we were compelled to travel at a full trot to keep up with him. Suddenly, just as the last vestiges of daylight begin to fade, Turner abruptly brings his mount to a halt. The rangers who have spent the bulk of the day now watching Turner's every move in anticipation of finding the Comanche's tracks quickly conglomerate behind him, sensing their quarry is near. Turner tells the young, inexperienced men, who could now easily become a liability should they lose their nerves or discipline, to keep an eye out for the Comanche sentries and to keep completely quiet. For the neophyte rangers, the hour is now at hand. They have now implicitly pledged their allegiance and obedience to a man who, only hours before, they had thought to be a local derelict an outright crazy person. Turner and the Texans proceed cautiously, keeping eyes peeled and ears open for any signs of the Comanche encampment. After traveling about 300 yards, they come into view of the camp, situated about a quarter of a mile to their right. With daylight quickly fading and intent on not losing the advantage of surprise, the party puts spurs to their horses and attacks immediately. For better or worse, these young men's first taste of combat will come without affording them the luxury of forethought. Turner and the rangers thunder toward the Comanche, where the warriors had made a cold camp and were just preparing to hunker down for the evening. The Comanche do not notice the oncoming charge until the Texans, with Turner out front, are roughly 50 yards from their position. 
This, however, still affords them enough time to take up their guns, bows, and arrows, and fire an initial retaliatory volley into the oncoming attackers. The Texans, with Turner out front, dismount from their horses and unleash an initial volley of their own from their rifles. Bigfoot Wallace gives his account of the first moments of the battle. Just as I sprang from the saddle to the ground, a big Indian stepped from behind a post oak tree and drew an arrow upon me that looked to me as long as a barber's pole. I jumped behind another tree as spry as a city clerk in a dry goods store when a parcel of women come around shopping. This dexterous move saves Wallace from a grisly demise as the arrow zips just past his head, taking a strip of bark off the tree he hides behind. Now gripped more by mortal fear than righteous indignance, Wallace attempts to retaliate with a shot from his rifle. But the young man's nerves are so shaken, he cannot steady his aim long enough to make an accurate shot, and misses the Comanche warrior entirely. The fight rages on for nearly 20 minutes, with hand-to-hand -hand fighting and close-quarters combat raging amidst the thick brush and fading sunlight. As Wallace and his cohorts do their best to comport themselves as reputably as possible, they look to Turner for inspiration and instruction. However, Turner gives no commands and his actions caused the young rangers more shock than awe. Nearly oblivious to the actions of his fellow Texans, Turner moves coolly and methodically towards the Comanche, firing, reloading, and moving, all with a wild look of equal parts bloodlust and jubilation in his eyes. Wallace gives his own account of Turner's actions during the attack. I noticed my friend Jeff several times during the fight, and each time he was engaged in lifting the hair from the head of an Indian that either he or someone else had shot. They say that practice makes perfect, and it was astonishing to see how quickly Jeff would take off an Indian's scalp and load his rifle in readiness for another. One slash from his butcher knife and a sudden jerk, and the bloody scalp was soon dangling from his belt. At the same time, he never seemed to be in a hurry, but was as cool and deliberate about everything he did as a carpenter when he is working by the day and not by the job. When the Indians began to retreat, one of them jumped on one of our horses, which they had tied hard and fast to post oaks near the camp, forgetting in his hurry to unfasten the rope. Round and round the tree he went until he wound himself up to the body when, just at that instant, Jeff plugged him with a half-ounce bullet and had his scalp off before he was done kicking. As darkness begins to take over the landscape, the Comanche mounted retreat into the vastness of the Texas wilderness. Still unsure of the Comanche motives, though, the rangers gather in a tight circle and begin to load their rifles as fast as their fatigued minds and digits will allow. Suddenly, a Comanche war cry pierces the air as a gunshot simultaneously rings out. Just as suddenly, a member of the Texans' party, left unnamed in Wallace's account but described as a tall, scant chap, falls to the ground, clasping his hands to his face. Boys, I am a dead man, the young Texan cries out, with Turner still preoccupied in finishing off and scalping any remaining warriors he could, the rangers scan the chaparral brush in the dusk light and notice a Comanche lying prone in the grass some thirty yards away. The warrior is clearly in the throes of dying from his own wounds. Wallace himself had seen the Comanche fall during the fight and presumed him to be dead. But, in his last moments, the warrior had risen up and fired a shot at the Texans and collapsed again. Moments later, he is gone, still clasping tightly to his weapon. According to Wallace's account, upon later examination, the warrior would be found to have suffered a total of seven bullet wounds before expiring. However, before any such examination can be made, Jeff Turner appears as if out of nowhere, covered in blood and knife in hand. He deftly separates the dead Comanche from his scalp, piercing a hole in the trophy and stringing it onto his belt before moving on. Despite all of the violence and gore, this seems to the young rangers to be the only time they have seen any measure of peace in Turner's otherwise perpetually tortured demeanor. Luckily for the young ranger who had been hit, his wound is mostly superficial, with a bullet having just grazed his head. Though shaken and with a slight gash on his head, he is otherwise unhurt. After the fight, and after securing a sizable portion of their stolen mounts, the rangers afforded themselves the luxury of a fire and a hot meal. 
and they were soon joined by the now placated Turner. As the exhausted Texans all gather around a freshly built campfire and recount the events of the day, their collective mood begins to relax. One of the young men recounts, with no lack of self-effacing humor, his inability to distinguish between fauna and foe, which caused him to repeatedly fire his rifle into a tree stump, thinking it to be a charging Comanche warrior. Most in the group find the story amusing, but Turner, in his momentary lapse from his normal demeanor, actually laughs out loud. The volume and veracity of his laughter surprises the younger men and even seems to catch Turner himself off guard. But, as Wallace would later recall, either the unusual sound of his own laugh frightened him, or else he had used up all of his stock on hand, for I never saw him crack a smile afterwards. Turner quickly recedes back into his normally morose demeanor, as the weight of reality once again seems to crash down upon his withered psyche. His eyes seem lost again, perhaps momentarily reliving flashes of his tragic past. After a brief rest and a quick meal, the Texans prepare to ride back to the Zumwalt settlement. However, once they reach the Zumwalt settlement, Turner bids the party a brief and unremarkable farewell and returns to his camp with his fresh scalps still dangling from his belt. Wallace's recollection is as follows. I was told when I was at that settlement several years after this that he had stayed around there for a good while, occasionally coming into the settlement for his supplies of ammunition, etc., and always bringing with him four or five scalps. Wallace would go on to serve his legendary career with the Rangers, living to the age of 82, finally passing away in 1899. He would claim in his memoirs to have no real knowledge of Turner's ultimate fate. However, this notion would be contested by a personal friend of Wallace's who, in the 1930s, would recall for a writer what Bigfoot Wallace had revealed to him about Turner's actual fate. But for tonight, the tales of Wallace's numerous and notorious exploits, as well as the brutal end of Jeff Turner's violent, tragic life, are other stories for other times. May 12th, 1858, Western Oklahoma. A Comanche chief drifts in and out of sleep as dawn approaches, comfortably ensconced with his family inside their sizable and surprisingly temperate lodge. The morning cooking fires have not yet been started and most in the camp are wrapped snugly in buffalo hide blankets. Most, perhaps even this chief, are just now starting to wake. The sun is just starting to peek over the eastern horizon, sending mesmerizing shimmers of light across the rippling waters of the nearby stream. This band of Comanche are known as the Quahati or Antelope Eaters, and this territory, encompassing large swaths of present-day Oklahoma and northern Texas, is their hard-won and much beloved home. They feel safe here, an even more elusive state over the past few years, as the pace and scope of Texas settlement had increased to never-before-seen levels. In response, the Comanche raids that had plagued the territory for decades now had reached a level of frequency and ferocity that few in Texas had ever seen before. Countless homesteads all along the edge of the Texas frontier, in river valley bottoms and rolling farmsteads, and even comparatively large cities like San Antonio and Austin, had seen the horrors and felt the wrath of the Comanche raiding machine. From Oklahoma to northern Mexico, the Comanche had cut a swath of violence that had stalled settlement for decades. Even with settlers who had grown up on the frontiers of Kentucky, Arkansas, and Virginia, where life was hard and threat of violence from native tribes was always a very real danger, Comanche raids were a world apart from what they were used to. Comanche raids entailed the killing of any and all fighting age males the institutionalized sexual abuse of female captives, the killing of infants or any burdensome prisoners, and the ritualized torture of any combatants who had managed to survive the fight. This had played itself out countless times, with numerous families being wiped out, countless family members being taken onto the frontier never to be seen again, and entire townships being abandoned, seemingly overnight, in panicked retreats to avoid further Comanche raiding. 
Perhaps one of the most bizarre and presumably unsettling sights these survivors reported seeing was that of a Comanche chief adorned not in just a headdress and war paint, but in an armored steel breastplate. The breastplate was that of a Spanish conquistador, a piece of armor that would have seemed nearly as anachronistic to 19th century settlers as it would be to us today. The popular legend was that it had been taken from a dead conquistador after a hard-fought, lonely battle somewhere on the desolate frontier had proven to be his last. It may very well have been traded for or acquired from another tribe, one of the many who had been driven off or all but eliminated by the Comanche, as part of the spoils of their victory. Though the origins remained dubious, its effect in contemporary combat and raiding was undoubted. Not only did the chief, known as Puhihitswa, or Iron Jacket, present a terrifying figure, he was afforded at least some measure of protection from small arms fire. His reputation within the tribe had grown through his successful recruitment and leading of raiding parties and the acquisition of horses and prisoners. It was, in fact, widely believed that Iron Jacket's armor made him invincible to the bullets of the Americans, Texans, and Mexicans. This band had been raiding the Texas countryside around what is today Brownwood, Texas. They had struck swiftly, killed many settlers whose names are now lost to history, wrought their usual havoc, and made off for their home country, some 300 miles to the north. Iron Jacket and his fellow Quahati felt safe this far away from the white settlements. They believed they were now so far onto the prairies, they were safe from any Texan attempts at reprisal. This appraisal of the situation is understandable, as the rolling, open grasslands of the Great Plains had proven such a formidable barrier against any consequential expansion for so long. The plains were featureless to the layman's eye and seemingly bereft of any usable resources to the uninitiated. This is not to say that the occasional pursuit of Comanche raiders had not been made far into the open grasslands, but, more often than not, they had ended with the pursuers either killed by the Comanche, or lost, stranded, and left to die of hunger and thirst in a seemingly endless ocean of land. But in the midst of all the raiding and turmoil, the Texans had been learning. More specifically, the Texas Rangers had been learning. They had been fighting the Comanche for decades now, and presented some of the only substantial resistance to the lords of the Southern Plains. They had been founded on October 17th of 1835 as a sort of hybrid force of military and law enforcement meant to combat raids from bandits, Mexican army forces, and, most notably, Comanche raiding parties. In the intervening decades between then and 1858, they had made extraordinary leaps in their skills, tactics, administration, and public relations. And, conversely, during this time, they had taken several sizable steps backward in virtually all of these areas. Their casualty rates often ranged near 50%. They were perpetually underfunded, either vilified or lionized in all popular publications, and had disbanded entirely and then reformed more than once. Now, the newly elected Texas governor, Hardin Richard Runnels, under pressure to make good on his campaign promises of putting a stop to the incessant bloodshed on the Texas frontier, had directed a force of rangers to pursue any and all known hostile native forces. On January 28th of 1858, Governor Runnels sent his official dispatch to his hand-picked ranger captain, the legendary John Salmon Rip Ford. It read, I impress upon you the necessity of action and energy. Follow any trail and all the hostiles or suspected hostile Indians you may discover and, if possible, overtake and chastise them if unfriendly. Ford had expected the directive for some time now, and he was quite ready. Though he had spent much of the previous six years in pursuit of political and entrepreneurial pursuits, Ford was an experienced, battle-hardened, and classically educated ranger veteran. He had been born in South Carolina in 1815, grown up in Tennessee, and moved to Texas in 1836. He had studied law, practiced medicine, 
and ridden with the Texas Mounted Rifles in the Texas Revolution. He had joined the Texas Rangers in the 1840s, ridden with legendary fighters like Bigfoot Wallace, Ben and Henry McCulloch, Matthew Old Paint Caldwell, and Jack Coffee Hayes. He had participated in some of the most violent encounters on the entirety of the American frontier, losing a finger in a fight against the Comanches and barely surviving more than a few times. He had acquired the name Rip during the Mexican War, where he served as a lieutenant and medical officer. In charge of notifying family members of the deaths of their beloved servicemen, Ford's repeated signing of R.I.P. or R.I.P. and the postscript of his official signature garnered him the unfortunate moniker. In recent years, he had made his home in Austin and was known as a devout Sunday school teacher, newspaper publisher, and sometime playwright. But after the harrowing summer of 1857, he had now found himself called upon again to fight the Comanche. Ford and his ranger contingent had wintered at Fort Belknap, northwest of modern-day Dallas. Here, they had trained in the rapid-fire tactics that would be their only hope on the vast expanses of what was then known as Comancheria. Rip Ford had been hired to reinstill some of the institutional knowledge that had been lost since the days of Jack Hayes and his lightning-fast, seemingly fearless, head-on attacks. Many young rangers had died hard deaths in the intervening years, falling prey to Comanche tactical traps such as feigned retreats or being caught and unfortunately killed in masterfully planned and horrifically violent ambushes. While Ford made his rangers combat ready at the fort, a trusted Tonkawa scout named Kichi ventured out into the open expanses of the northwest. Scouting for the Comanche, the rangers had been commissioned to hunt down and engage. It is often overlooked, yet an undeniable fact, that without the native scouts, all but the most inveterate, trail-savvy frontiersmen would have been essentially hapless in their attempts at trailing the natives that they pursued. Such was the case here, as the ranger captain waited pensively for the return of Kichi and prayed that he had good news to report. In April, Kichi returned to the fort, bringing with him the news that Ford had been hoping for. He had found a village far to the northwest. They were hunting near the Canadian River, and if the rangers left immediately, they might stand a chance of apprehending them. On April 22nd, Ford and his rangers had made their way out of the relative safety of the fort and followed the Brazos River northwest. Their initial force upon leaving the fort consisted of 102 men, two wagons, a field ambulance wagon, and 15 pack mules. They marched to Cottonwood Springs, where their forces were augmented by Captain Shapley T. Ross and his force of 113 native warriors, mostly from the Tonkawa, Waco, Shawnee, Delaware, and Tawakoni tribes, all of whom had suffered dearly and recently due to Comanche raiding. On the 29th of April, they crossed the Red River. This meant they were now operating outside the official jurisdiction of Texas, and now venturing into what was known as Indian Country. The rangers and their allies all traveled light as a general rule while on the trail. Sundries and rations were often eschewed in favor of more ammunition and weapons. This meant that substantial portions of their daily caloric intake came from the game they were able to hunt along the way. Deer and rabbit were common fare, but buffalo was most prized, and in 1858, most plentiful. On May 10th, some of the scouts who had killed a buffalo noticed that Comanche arrowheads were lodged in its flesh. Though it had fallen to these scouts' efforts, this animal had recently, narrowly, escaped becoming food for the Comanche. This meant the Comanche were close. Scouts were sent to fan out across the countryside in hopes of spotting where the Comanche were hunting. The camp of rangers and native warriors now sensed the fight was close. They waited with bated breath as the scouts conducted their reconnaissance. The scouts returned with news that they had spotted a Comanche hunting party and trailed them to the camp on the Canadian River. Now they had to move fast before the Comanche discovered them. As Iron Jacket slept in his warm lodge only a few miles away, 
Rip Ford roused his rangers and native forces from their fitful sleeps in yet another cold camp. As they checked their weapons and saddled their horses, the native warriors among them wrapped their heads in strips of white cloth in order to dissuade any potential friendly fire from overzealous Texans. Kichi, their revered scout, had reported there to be two villages, one smaller and composed of five lodges. The second, much larger village was across the river and composed of about 350 warriors, not including the women and children. The rangers and their native allies then broke camp, leaving the two wagons, the field ambulance, and pack mules under the care of a guard commanded by Ford's 73-year-old father, Captain William Ford. The force rode six miles in the dark, making their way to the small villages first. At 7 a.m., the chaos and killing began. The initial charge was made with the rangers and their allies pouring into the village, killing any warriors they could. Two Comanche had escaped, however, and were now riding hard for the larger village across the river, some three miles away. Ford and his rangers and most of their native allies continued the chase, intending to cut down the fleeing Comanche before they could alert the larger village. Many of the Tonkawas, though, stopped. Of all the native peoples in the multicultural contingent, the Tonkawas had perhaps the longest standing and most deeply rooted hatred for the Comanche. For decades now, they had borne the brunt of the Comanche incursion into central Texas and lost many of their friends and family members to Comanche atrocities. While the rangers and most of their allies rode on, many Tonkawa looted, burned, and killed any Comanche that they could. As the screams of the first village faded behind them, Ford and his remaining forces slogged across the Canadian River. Many had to dismount, and some even became stranded afoot after losing their horses. They were left to chase their mounted comrades, all in a desperate race to hit the Comanche camp before the Comanche camp could mount a defense and counterattack. But, much to their dismay, the two Comanche who had fled the smaller camp were indeed able to make it to the larger camp in time to warn their people of what was happening. Iron Jacket had likely been warming himself next to his morning campfire when the two Comanche came barreling into the camp, screaming and pleading for help. There would have been no time to waste as the chief gathered his weapons ordered his children to help his wives making the camp ready to move, and then donned his prized Spanish armor. Then he and his fellow warriors were off, riding out of the village at full speed with the intent to not only thwart the ranger attack, but to kill any and all that they could. The ranger's native allies had beaten them to the village by a few hundred yards, and thus were the first to receive the Comanche reprisal attack. For all their vaunted martial superiority, though, on this day, the Comanche were unaware of a particular advantage held by the white headband-adorned Wacos, Shawnee, Delaware, Tawankoni, and remaining Tonkawa. They had been equipped with repeating rifles and six-shot revolvers. While this may have been a safe assumption when attacking any ranger force in 1858, it was a shock to many of the Comanche that the natives riding with the rangers had also been complementarily endowed with such formidable firepower. As the rangers closed the ground between themselves and their allies as quickly as possible, Ford and his lieutenants exhorted them to shoot the oncoming Comanche. A volley was soon poured into the Comanche forces from the native allies, and Iron Jacket and his horse fell dead. This left the remaining Comanche warriors in a momentary shock as most among their band truly believed Iron Jacket to be invincible from bullets when clad in his famous armor. But this had not proven the case. Confused and momentarily defeated, the surviving Comanche dashed back to their village. As they made their way back to the village, however, they were greeted by Ford's rangers who came smashing into the village at full force. Amid the din and chaos of screams and gunfire, Ford's rangers would recall him as cool and collected. Ford did his best to exert some measure of direction to the chaos unfolding, but the fight soon devolved into a smattering of smaller, individual combats playing themselves out over a vast 18 square mile stretch of land. After a few hours of this brutal but sporadic fighting, 
the rangers reconvened at the Comanche village. Ford hoped to size up the situation, take stock of his forces, and make away with what loot they could before a Comanche counterattack could be mounted. At the village, however, Ford found Captain Shapley Ross, the initial nominal commander of the native allies who had joined the rangers on the Brazos River, marshalling their allies into a battle line. A Comanche counterattack, Ross insisted, was coming sooner rather than later. Appraising his forces, Ford noticed two of his newest, youngest rangers, Privates Oliver Searcy and Robert Nichols, were unaccounted for. Almost as suddenly as their absence was noted, though, Oliver Searcy came running breathlessly into camp. In between gulps of air, he informed his commander that he and Nichols had been amongst the rangers who had abandoned their mounts in the quagmire of the Canadian River's thick, encompassing mud. Footbound and still raging for a fight, the young rangers had missed the initial volley that had felled the great iron jacket, but had chased after the retreating Comanche as they fled to the northwest. But, as so often happened on the frontier, pursuing young rangers soon found themselves surrounded by Comanche warriors, cut off from retreat. Nichols and Searcy had made a mad dash for a set of ravines near the river, turning and firing when they could to check the advances of their Comanche pursuers. Nichols, however, was overrun and killed. Bled out at the end of Comanche lances, Circe had managed to reach the ravine and evade the Comanche within its labyrinthian confines. He had dashed his way back into camp after hiding for a time and was severely shaken, both mentally and physically. But while Oliver Circe's fighting was done for the day, the Comanche retaliation had only just begun. Almost as soon as Circe's warnings of Comanche being close behind him had time to reach the ears of every man in camp, Captain Ross spotted a group of mounted Comanche warriors coming towards them. They were led by a large, powerfully built young warrior. His name was Peter Nakona, and he was the son of Iron Jacket and a much respected and well-known warrior himself. As Peter Nakona and his warriors deftly maneuvered their ponies through a thick on the side of the bank sloping down toward the river, Ross convened with Ford and his native forces as to what their next move might be. Ross was worried the Comanche, under the leadership of this new, younger chief, might be able to secure a position on the high ground behind the ranger's new captured campsite. However, he was resolutely informed by one of his Tonkawa scouts that he needed to fear not. The scout then mounted his horse and rode, with only spear and shield in hand, into the open ground between the Comanche and ranger positions. What happened next seemed nearly as unbelievable to the rangers present as a scene from medieval antiquity. The lone Tonkawa began shouting taunts at the Comanche force up on the ridge. He said, We have nothing to fight for. We have some of your women and children captives. Also we have your wigwams, your buffalo meat, and your horses. You come down. You have something to fight for. For over half an hour, the Comanche and native allies of the rangers engaged in one-on-one -on -one taunting battles, followed by charges and bouts of hand-to-hand -hand combat between warriors clashing on horseback. This clash presented not only a unique sight, however, it was also a tactical break that Ford needed. He commanded a detachment, commanded by Lieutenant Allison Nelson, to flank the Comanche position and cut off any routes of retreat that they might have had. Ford then had the native ally forces recalled to the village in hopes of marshalling his forces for an all-out frontal assault on the Comanche position. However, this, as much of the rest of Ford's plan thus far, did not go entirely as he intended. A force of bloodthirsty Tonkawa could not be detained, and their premature attack alerted Peter Nakona and his Comanche to the rangers' intentions. With the Comanche intention of drawing attention towards themselves and enabling what was left of their wives and children to escape being accomplished, Peter Nokona now saw no need to stand and fight any farther. He led his forces on a retreat over the rolling hills with the Tonkawas in hot pursuit. Ford, meanwhile, was informed by a captured Comanche woman that an even bigger camp lay a number of miles away under the command of the famed and feared Buffalo Hump. This would likely be Peter Nakona and the other survivors' destination, 
and a much larger, much deadlier counterattack would likely come soon. Now, seeing a tactical egress to Texas territory as his most prudent option, Ford ordered the prisoners, 16 in total, shackled, the wounded placed on the ambulance, and waited as the Tonkawa pursuers straggled into camp one by one. As they did, Ford noticed their horses laden down with Comanche hands, feet, and strips of flesh, all strapped to their mounts and flapping in the wind. Such was the deep hatred that fueled warfare on the plains. In all, 76 Comanche had been killed, with Ford losing only the young ranger Nichols and a young Waco warrior who had been lanced by his Comanche opponent in the one-on-one -on -one battles. On May 13th, the force of rangers and native allies began their trek, wounded and prisoners in tow, back to the Brazos Agency. The force arrived on May 20th to widespread acclaim as a successful manifestation of the governor's new policies. But the war was far from over. Buffalo Hump and Peta Nakona would soon be riding roughshod over the entirety of the Southern Plains. Their retribution would be swift, harsh, and all-encompassing. Nakona would go on, in fact, to marry a kidnapped white woman named Cynthia Ann Parker. Together, the couple would have three children, one of which would become the legendary last chief of the Comanche people, Quana Parker. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. May 29th, 1850, eight miles northwest of present-day Alice, Texas, Captain John Rip Ford and his contingent of Texas Rangers are making their way down a tributary of the Nueces River. They are on their way south, toward their headquarters at San Antonio Viejo, or Old San Antonio, near the U.S.-Mexico border on the Rio Grande. Captain Ford, known as Rip, which many apocryphal accounts attribute to his signing of so many death notices while serving as a quartermaster in the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848, has just celebrated his 35th birthday. He is joined by several other veterans of the war, all of whom are in their 20s and early 30s. Second in command is Lieutenant Andrew Jackson Walker. Malkia Benjamin Highsmith serves as quartermaster and commissary. David Level serves as orderly, and Philip N. Luckett serves as the surgeon. Though young, all have considerable combat experience in the brutal conflicts of the Mexican-American War. A number of other rangers rounded out their ranks, including William Gillespie. Gillespie, a relatively new ranger, had also served in the Mexican-American War and came from a family who held a revered and respected place in the ranger history. His uncle, Robert Gillespie, had served with distinction along with ranger legends such as Jack Hayes, Bigfoot Wallace, Samuel Walker, and Rip Ford himself. Robert Addison Gillespie, known as Addy to his friends, had served with distinction in countless campaigns against the Comanche. He had met his end four years earlier while serving in the Mexican-American War. On September 22, 1846, in the Battle of Monterey, the Elder Gillespie had reportedly been the first ranger to breach the perimeter of the fort on Independence Hill. During the action, he was shot in the torso and mortally wounded. He would succumb to his wound a day later, on September 23rd. William Gillespie, determined to follow in his legendary uncle's footsteps, was keen to engage the Comanche and solidify his own reputation with the Rangers. The Rangers' lead scout is a half-Comanche, half-Mexican man named Rocco Magricio, who spoke three languages, Spanish, English, and Comanche, and was thoroughly familiar with the territory they were in, near the Nueces River. He was also reputed to have an otherworldly sense of smell. Despite the highly desirable skill set of their scout, they had spent much of the previous fall in pursuing specter-like bands of Comanche in vain all throughout South Texas. They had, in fact, not even seen any Comanche in many months. This had been a source of great frustration for Ford, certainly, but even more so for the young and battle-hungry amongst them, like William Gillespie. During this spring, though, combat with the Comanche had seemed a more and more certain prospect. Their first contact would come as a shock, though, when they were startled awake on May 26th by the gunshot of a ranger posted as sentry. 
His intended target had been a group of shadowy figures astride several of the ranger's horses, riding away from the herd at a full gallop. After the riders did not halt at the sentry's orders, the ranger opened fire, hitting one unfortunate rider in the torso and knocking him to the ground. Until the sun broke on the eastern horizon, no ranger left the perimeter of the camp for fear of being caught in an ambush in the dark. However, once dawn broke, the group was sent out to retrieve the unidentified would-be horse thief. They returned to camp soon after, bearing with them the barely alive body of a teenage Comanche warrior. He had been part of a group of young warriors intent on stealing the Texans' horses, garnering themselves a measure of material wealth and social renown. Though his cohorts had managed to escape, this unfortunate young man had been mortally wounded by the sentry's shot. As he expired, the rangers rode out of camp and reconnoitered an area several miles in circumference, finding none of the unfortunate young warrior's companions. Later that day, Captain Ford scribbled a note detailing their location and contact with the Comanches and requesting reinforcements. He dispatched another eventual ranger legend, Edward Burleson Jr., to carry the message to the nearby Fort Merrill. Burleson departed and later returned that afternoon, reporting of a dismal, even downright disturbing state of affairs at the fort. The commander, J.B. Plummer, seemed not only unconcerned with the potential danger, but also upset with the rangers for their early morning gunshots disturbing his troopers' sleep. Plummer dismissed the reports of Comanche being so close to the fort, despite the tangible proof of a dying prisoner in the custody of the rangers. His reticent agreement to send a small detachment of his regulars back to the ranger camp with Burleson only resulted in the already bizarre situation deteriorating into the macabre. That night, one of the regulars wandered about the camp, toting the head of the recently deceased Comanche as a trophy. Even for the veteran rangers, and especially for their neophyte brethren, such a sight was both disgusting and distasteful. Ford described the man as loony and sent the regulars away upon being made aware of the reprehensible display. Now, three days later, as they made their way south, their eyes always scanning the brush and horizon for potential dangers, many among them desired only to exit this territory and secure a few days respite within the walls of San Antonio Viejo. Once ensconced within the comparative safety of sturdy, cool adobe walls and tempering their nerves with a stiff drink, Perhaps their minds could unwind enough to process the events of the preceding 72 hours. But San Antonio Viejo was still a long ride up the Nueces from here. And whether the rangers knew it or not, there would be no respite from violence and danger anywhere in their near future. For, though the Texas frontier was a vast expanse of territory that did not always lend itself to ease in travel nor communication, word did spread fast and word had spread to the Comanche, via the survivors of the failed raid on the ranger encampment, that the Texians had inflicted a hard death on one of their beloved tribesmen. Though the Comanche could be harsh, unremitting, and even overtly inhumane to even the most innocent of their enemy, Comanche families and bands were incredibly close and unyieldingly sentimental. As was common amongst many Plains tribes, the Comanche ceremonial grieving process often involved self-mortification that could at times even result in the death of the practitioner. The Comanche, though, perhaps more than any tribe, managed to perpetually strike a Newtonian balance in avenging wrongs done to them. That is to say, to whatever degree they perceived themselves to have been aggrieved, it was their right, nigh their karmic duty, to seek vengeance via an equal and opposite degree of violence. The rangers were all too aware of the Comanche's propensity for combat, and thus a tense anticipation pervaded their ranks as they rode south. For better or for worse, though, they would not have to suffer the pangs of dread long. They had broke camp at dawn, and by mid-morning, their scout, Roquet, had spotted the tracks of several unshod horses, sign of a war party being nearby. The Comanche would have been aware of the party's likely destination, as it was the only fort on the Nueces between their current location and the fort they had just left. Thus, Ford and his rangers assumed, correctly as it would turn out, that the Comanche intended to cut off their current path of travel. With the Comanche, and thereby mortal danger, near at hand, 
thoughts of relaxing in a border cantina or reposing in a warm bed at their destination were quickly replaced with the immediate demands of combat. Their first engagement saw them being fired upon by a small party of Comanche attackers, another small group of younger braves out reconnoitering the territory. The attackers were quickly disconcerted by the firepower of the ranger contingent. By 1850, the rangers, though only a decade and a half old, had already contributed significantly to advancements in firearm technology. The intervening time had seen the average ranger outfitted at first with single-shot pistols, then five-shot Patterson Colt revolvers with removable cylinders, to, at this time, the most recent iteration of the Colt revolver, the 1847 Walker Colt. Its predecessor, the Patterson Colt, had been the brainchild of a young New Jersey inventor named Samuel Colt. Colt had first designed the pistol with its revolving cylinder in 1836. Though the implementation of a revolving cylinder was not invented by Samuel Colt, his hope was to bring the concept to its fullest fruition. Though at first it seemed there was no commercial interest in his invention, it would be the burgeoning Republic of Texas who would be an early purchaser of the firearm. In 1839, the Republic would officially purchase 180 of the revolvers for use by, of all things, the Texas Navy. At the time, pirates did frequent the coast of Texas, and the Republic needed to defend itself against possible international incursions now that it was, for the time being, operating as an autonomous entity. However, Governor Sam Houston would disband them in 1843, freeing up the stocks of now unused revolvers for Texas's newest military experiment, the Texas Rangers. The Rangers, who traced their lineage to Stephen F. Austin's ranging companies of the 1830s, were a motley assemblage of combative and adventurous young men whom Texas sought to employ as a light-mounted cavalry. In the intervening years, both the Rangers and the Revolver would be pit through the refiner's fire of hard, frequent, and highly mobile combat engagements with adversaries ranging from cattle thieves to Mexican soldiers to Comanche warriors. Colt even struck up a correspondence and eventual friendship with Ranger Samuel Walker in which the Ranger related suggestions for improvements and letters oftentimes written not far from the front lines. Walker was a Maryland native who had come to Texas in 1842 via the port at Galveston. He had served under Captain Jesse Billingsley in an ill-fated invasion into Mexico, only to be captured, held as a POW, and narrowly survive what is known to history as the Black Bean Incident, linked to episode in description. Upon returning to Texas, Walker enlisted with the Rangers, and via his experiences in fighting the Comanche, Kiowa, Apache, and in the Mexican-American War, he would come to suggest adding a fixed trigger guard, interchangeable parts for easier repair in the field, and, perhaps most distinctively, adding one chamber to the cylinder, making it a six-shot revolver. The finished product, what would come to be known as the Colt Walker revolver, would weigh in at 4.5 pounds, with a length of nearly a foot and a quarter, firing a 44 caliber ball with an effective range of roughly 100 yards. This made the Colt Walker what amounted to a handheld cannon, especially by the standards of the time. Rip Ford himself, who served with Samuel Walker throughout many of the same campaigns, including the Battle of Veracruz, remarked that the pistol was indeed more powerful than the 54 caliber Mississippi rifle after seeing its lethality at distance in combat. The Rangers quickly adopted the new revolvers in 1847, and Walker himself would carry two into combat late that year at the Battle of Huamantla. It would be here on October 9, 1847, that the young Ranger captain would be shot and killed by a sniper. Though Walker had fallen, his legacy and the legacy of the firearm he had helped to build were still keenly felt just over two years later here on the Nueces River. Rip Ford and the countless other veterans of the war in which Walker perished no doubt felt an extra measure of gratitude for his efforts now that they found themselves surrounded and far from home. The Walker cult enabled them to lay down a field and rate of fire that could overwhelm the rate of fire that the Comanche were capable of with their short, high draw weight bows. The Comanche had long dominated the battlefield in terms of rate of fire and maneuverability, two key factors in any engagement. The horsemanship of the average Comanche warrior enabled him to fire his weapon while hanging off the side of the horse. 
protected from counterfire by the animal's body. He could loose his arrow from over the horse's back, as well as under or over the horse's neck, all while shielding himself from consequential counterattack. These skills were not inherent in the Comanche more than any other people. The difference lie in their lifestyle and training. The Comanche were highly practiced from very young ages at skill sets that would eventually stack together to present the fully formed, fully grown warrior that ruled the southern plains. Comanche children, boys and girls, were taught to ride and to shoot. Common practice drills involved picking up objects off the ground while riding their horses at progressively faster speeds upon every attempt, as well as shooting live birds out of the air with blunted arrows as a means of target practice. But the rangers, for all their reputation as an ad hoc assemblage of killers for hire, were in fact disciplined, drilled professionals who were not only superb horsemen, but incredibly accurate marksmen while mounted, as well as sound, small group tacticians. And the rangers were not only well armed, but mounted on some of the finest horses in Texas. A prospective ranger was not allowed to join the ranks with a horse valued at less than $100. Adjusted for inflation, this would be a cost of roughly $3,900 today. The rangers were indeed known for their decided lack of military discipline, dress, and decorum. They were free to wear what pleased them, from wide-brimmed hats and serapes to buckskin leggings and coonskin caps. But in combat, they were highly disciplined, highly mobile, and highly dangerous. In 1850, they were essentially the only military force capable of engaging the Comanche on the Comanche's level. On this day, though, that premise would be certainly put to the test. After their initial skirmish, near what was known as Rancho Amagosa, Ford ordered his men into skirmish lines spaced out a few yards apart, and the contingent carried on, Colt Walker revolvers drawn and ready. They moved as quietly as possible, communicating via either hand signs or in the most hushed of tones. They would travel another four miles up the Nueces before coming inside of the Comanche's camp, near what is known as Agua Dulce Creek. The Comanche that had attacked them earlier had disappeared to the north, and had evidently not yet returned to their camp to sound the alarm that the rangers were on their way. This delay meant the rangers possessed the element of surprise, and Rip Ford sought to use that advantage to its fullest extent immediately. With Ford leading the charge, the rangers rode full speed towards the unsuspecting war party's camp. The Comanche in camp, soon sensing the oncoming commotion of hoofbeats and riders' exhortations, snatched up their weapons and made a mad dash for their horses. Seconds later, the rangers would smash into the Comanche camp at full force. Now riding at top speed and loosing howling war cries of their own, the rangers barreled in amongst the Comanche, shooting down any and all that they could at first sight. No exception was made for the mounts of the Comanche either, as several of them were shot down at point-blank range in order to bring their rider to the ground. Over the course of the next few minutes, a brutal close-quarters combat would unfold throughout the camp, with some warriors standing to fight and others attempting to escape into the mesquite brush that surrounded them. Those who stood and fought were almost all shot down where they stood, while those who retreated into the brush were pursued by mounted rangers intent on killing them. When the dust had settled, Rip Ford's rangers had killed four of the Comanche warriors in the camp and, by Ford's account, wounded up to seven. In the immediate aftermath, many of the rangers were flush with the thrill of victory and shouts of triumph and congratulations abounded. Then, they heard the screams. In all the commotion, despite what any of them would consider a resounding victory, one of their own had been gravely wounded. Young William Gillespie had been riding through the village on the attack, bringing up the rear as a younger ranger. Ahead of him, he saw a Comanche warrior attempting to flee the village on horseback. The warrior was, however, brought down in quick succession by a shot to the neck and an additional shot to the back. Gillespie watched the warrior fall from his horse, presuming him to be dead as he rode past. But, though mortally wounded, the warrior was not dead. The warrior had managed to bring himself up to a sitting position after Gillespie had ridden by him. Seeing this, Gillespie wheeled his horse around in an effort to shoot the fallen Comanche with his revolver. However, the animal lurched and caused the young man to misfire into the ground between himself and the Comanche. This momentary mishap 
created all the time the Comanche warrior needed to draw his bow one final time, and, before expiring of his own wounds, loose an arrow that struck Gillespie under the ribcage, piercing his lung. Mortally wounded, the ranger slumped in the saddle. Seeing this, Captain Ford called his rangers off the pursuit of the fleeing Comanche and into two squads. One squad formed a defensive line to shield the second, who ushered Gillespie, still slumped in his saddle, to safety. For a tense moment, the fleeing Comanche turned and seemed to ponder an attack on the now compromised rangers, who had just done them so much harm and killed four of their own. However, they were not afforded much time in contemplation, as the ranger squad holding the defensive position soon burst into a headlong attack towards them. The Comanche fled into the mesquite, leaving their wounded to the mercy of the rangers. Once outside the effective range of the rangers' firearms, though, the remaining Comanche would continue to taunt and torment the rangers from afar, shielded from sight by the brush and darkness. Meanwhile, the rangers had commandeered what was the Comanche camp only a short time earlier, and turned it into the closest approximation to a field hospital as they were able. Their efforts would do little good, though. Gillespie's wound was severe, with the arrow penetrating deep into his ribcage. In the succeeding hours, he would die a slow, agonizing death. Gillespie was much beloved amongst his cohorts, and the fact that his legendary uncle had suffered such a similar, terrifying fate only a few short years before, was not lost on any of the rangers present. But their work was not done. Those not tending to Gillespie were sent out to inspect and treat the horses, many of whom had been injured in the fight. Others were sent out to scout the perimeter of the camp on the lookout for any lingering Comanche. These rangers returned soon after with a young Comanche who had been injured in the fight and hidden in the brush. The boy had been hit twice by gunshots in the arm, but, much to the rangers' surprise and admiration, remained silent and stoic since being discovered. The boy apparently assumed that he would be taken to the rangers' chief and summarily executed. When he was informed that he would in fact not be harmed, he remained dubious but peaceable. The young man informed the rangers that he was the son of a war chief and that his people had bestowed upon him the rather unfortunate moniker of carne muerto, or dead meat. Were it not for the present circumstances, the bizarre nature of this scenario might have provided some much needed levity. But as the mortally wounded William Gillespie writhed in pain only a few yards away, there was no laughter to be had. The rangers made camp and endured a restless, agonizing night, one that their friend and compatriot Gillespie would not survive. Some time before the sun rose, the young ranger, who had dreamed of serving proudly and solidifying his own legend, passed away. Captain Ford, who no doubt bore a considerable amount of grief and guilt, having long known the Gillespie family, ordered the young man's body tied to a mule. The rangers then made their way to the top of a small hill near Agua Dolce Creek, where a grave was dug, and Gillespie was wrapped in a blanket, still wearing his boots, still with his hat on. What Ford himself described as a sad but simple service was held, with prayers offered and scriptures read. All the while, the young Comanche captive, who had been brought along in tow, stared silently at the open grave that had been dug. Like most Comanche, he would have been all too aware that the rangers had a reputation for exacting harsh revenge of their own on their prisoners. And he believed that, after the death of their comrade, the rangers now meant to kill him in retribution and bury him in the grave. He was, however, informed that this would not be the case. Gillespie's body was then lowered as gently as possible into the grave, covered with rocks to dissuade the wolves and coyotes, and then the rangers moved on heading again towards San Antonio Viejo, with one less ranger and one more prisoner in tow. They would indeed make it to San Antonio Viejo. But the story of the rangers fighting the mighty Comanche here in the unforgiving Texas frontier was far from over. Rip Ford and many of the men present that day would go on to legendary careers with the rangers. Though the fate of Carno Muerte, the young Comanche brave taken prisoner, is lost to history, the fate of Comanches was far from determined. Their reign as lords of the southern plains would continue on for at least a quarter century more, as would the tales of horrific raids, merciless battles, 
and the ongoing fight to hold on to the territory they believed to be rightfully theirs. But those, like the countless other stories from the Old West, are other stories for other times. <laughs>